it's settled. And, Doing Steve, it's good to see The Ways and Means Committee will now come to order. The next order of our business this morning is hearing on the proposed fiscal 2023 budget. Secretary Becerra, we want to extend, as always, a warm welcome to you and welcome you back to the Ways and Means Committee. Also, we want to acknowledge Melanie Higorin, who's been a, a stalwart of the staff here on the Democratic side for years. It was my good fortune yesterday uh, to visit with administration officials and uh, see a lot of former Ways and Means staffers that are carefully populated on Capitol Hill. And in fairness to the Republican side, uh, as I met with the uh, WTO chairperson yesterday, the Republican staff was well represented there. And as alums of this committee, we're reminded about the talent that serves us every day. So we meet this morning at an inflection point. We are shifting our focus from the urgency of the COVID public health crisis to confronting the virus as an enduring epidemic, while also simultaneously attacking the other challenges that threaten the health and well-being of the American people. When you last visited uh, this committee, Mr. Secretary, the COVID vaccine was rolling out publicly. Now 219 million Americans have been fully vaccinated. Let me make a point here. In March of 2020, on, Feb on March 11th, that's the day that Dr. Fauci gave his warning of what was to come. And we have endured this pandemic, but when you look at 219 million Americans fully vaccinated, it tells a very optimistic story as well. 2.8 million Americans signed up for health coverage under this administration's special enrollment period, and over 90 percent of these new enrollees benefited from the committee's premium tax credits. These impressive strides are thanks to Joe Biden's visionary leadership, as well as the hard work of your team, Mr. Secretary, healthcare workers and public officials as well. But most importantly, it's the result of the trust the American people have placed in our institutions. We still have much more work to do. We should do it together. For example, the permanent increase in child care funding that the Ways and Means Committee fought to include in the American Rescue pa Package is just a first step toward guaranteed access to child care that parents need. Our vital caregiving workforce is still paid too little and stretched far too thin. Looking ahead, this committee is confronting the multidimensional nature 
of health, well-being, and equity. From health disparities to the long-standing problems in our delivery and access to mental health services, it's clear that life's circumstances have a cumulative effect on one's health. Any successful strategies must acknowledge the stigmas and structural inequities that for far too long have plagued our health care system. Mr. Secretary, I know that that is something that is near and dear to your heart, and it's called the Affordable Care Act. In the 12 years since President Obama signed the landmark law, 30 million more Americans have gained health coverage, and 135 million Americans with pre-existing conditions have benefited from the law's transformational protections. Even while there has been opposition from the other side, in many cases, some fought tooth and nail to strip Americans of the health care coverage. We continued throughout the pandemic's public health care crisis to embrace it. We stayed the course and we strengthened the ACA. Without a doubt, Democrats take great satisfaction from the improved health care system in this country because of it. Every child in Massachusetts has health insurance, and 97 percent of the adults in Massachusetts are all covered. It's an astounding statistic and it continues to poll in the high 70s in the state in terms of satisfaction. We have took dozens of votes and dozens of times over the years, too much time to repeal the ACA. The other side oftentimes declined to put forward their own health care proposal, but perhaps that plan someday will emerge as we attempt to address inflation as well. We've chosen a path of action and results, lowering costs, expanding coverage, and saving lives. As a result, enrollment is at an all-time high, premiums are down, and the law's popularity is considerably up. Now we must build upon this progress by permanently investing in the improved premium tax credit. We note that premiums dropped on average by $67 a month and saved families over $800 annually in the past year thanks to the American Rescue Plan's expanded credit. These are the types of investments that grow the insured population and spread risk, which in turn will help those covered by the ACA remain covered. I'm grateful for President Biden's comprehensive strategy to address our nation's mental health crisis as well. The budget's historic investment in improving mental health also acknowledges the connection between mental health and substance abuse. The committee, until recently, we have attempted to hold a series of hearings on these topics where we heard loud and clear that the current mental health crisis calls for expanded coverage and reduced cost for mental health services. We also know that we have to invest in a diverse mental health workforce. Improving care for nursing home residents and our nation's seniors is another important priority of the Ways and Means Committee. The last two years have unfortunately shown a bright light on where these facilities are coming up short. The committee has led on the Elder Justice Act to protect residents and improve the quality of care, but more must be done, and we look forward to working with you, Mr. Secretary, on this pressing matter. We're eager to work with you and the Biden administration on building a healthier, more equitable America. Our committee's racial equity initiative is examining the drivers of health care disparities. We have examined the need for a more diverse physician pipeline and how clinical algorithms may well discriminate. We are urgently working to advance legislation that creates a more equitable society, and I know that the Biden administration will be a full partner as we proceed with this work. I'm pleased, Mr. Secretary, to note that your department has begun to address the climate issue as well. The impact of the climate crisis on health care is well documented, yet less attention has been paid to the role of the health care industry in producing greenhouse gas. For this reason, the committee has made a request for information from healthcare organizations regarding their work to combat the climate crisis. Their responses will be vital in helping us develop policies that will support and promote climate action changes in the healthcare sector. Looking ahead to the post-pandemic life, it is time to deepen our investments in the American family. Ways and Means Democrats continue to push and put forth policies to invest in child care and create career pathways for low-income parents. We also expect to work closely with you and our Republican colleagues to reauthorize the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program and the Critical Child Welfare Programs that accompany it to strengthen them for the future. Covered a lot, but as we all know, there's a myriad of challenges that face the health and well-being of the American family. I think I can speak for all of us when I say how pleased we are to welcome an esteemed former Ways and Means member back to our committee. 
Look forward to this partnership as we work together to improve the health and well-being of the American people. With that, let me now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I join you in welcoming Secretary Basir back to, um, to the best and biggest uh, committee uh, in Congress and the most effective. First, I want to thank you for working with the State of Texas on the extension of our 1115 waiver. As we spoke last night, this announcement will provide hospitals in Texas, including the Valley, with certainty they need to continue providing care to the more than 4 million Texans, including half of all the children in the state, depend on the stability of the state's Medicaid program. And as we noted in our conversation last night, we are concerned about the upcoming expiration of the state's directed payment program and look forward to working with you uh, on addressing that. So last year, Republicans expressed that given your background, reputation on the committee, we could work together to restore the economy, improve Americans' health care, address the major crisis facing American families. But since then, we, we've been disappointed. We've not seen, I think, the follow-up and the ability to partner that we would like to see. And in general, writ large in the Biden administration, we haven't seen that either. We know health care often depends upon socioeconomic factors. They matter. Uh, and on the economy, uh, we are worried price increases are accelerating. Uh, last uh, month, rising three times faster than workers' paychecks. Experts point to the Democrat policies like the nearly $2 trillion partisan COVID stimulus as the reason why America leads the world, in many cases in inflation. Today's economic news is, is very troubling. Under President Biden's leadership, our economy is actually shrinking. And the President's missed four of the five quarterly economic projections, so Americans ought to brace for slower job growth and higher prices ahead. On health, we believe the administration has undermined Americans' care, increased prices, and reduced access to new innovative treatments. Medicare is barreling toward insolvency, while seniors' premiums have swelled. On addressing the crises Americans face, the President's policies have only added more fuel to the fire. Our southern border, which I know well, is overwhelmed with illegal migrants, unaccompanied minors, suspected terrorists, and smugglers of fentanyl. The President's budget chooses partisanship over solutions, committing to economic self-sabotage, undermining Americans' health care, and I think ignoring the crisis where action is desperately needed. The Democrats' one-size-fits-all approach to health care in particular puts Washington in charge of Americans' medical decisions. The budget expands the so-called Affordable Care Act, which push, pushed up prices cut off families from their coverage and their doctors, and we've actually seen a lowering of life expectancy. The administration does nothing to address rising costs in this. And as a result, health care continues to be a huge issue in America, both in underserved and rural communities and in, in the inner city as well, where we think there can be strong bipartisan solutions. Extending lavish Obamacare subsidies during COVID eliminated a key incentive for people to return to work and rejoin the workforce where Main Street businesses need these workers. The administration has the tools to address the cost of surprise medical billing, but as we've talked before, instead of the clear following the clear letter of the law, I believe the rules out of HHS has really delayed and, and damaged the implementation of a historic bipartisan consumer protection law, the No Surprises Act. This committee on both sides of the aisle did a lot of hard work and delib deliberative action to find that compromise. And I believe that wasting taxpayer resources trying to overturn Congress's careful compromise led by this committee, those actions threaten to tip the scales and worsen patients' access to their doctors. I worry that the administration has a troubling pattern of ignoring clear statutory language from Congress and acting beyond its legal authority. An example, the decision to ignore years of legal interpretation surrounding the family glitch in the ACA and the abuse of pandemic flexibilities to advance an agenda away from COVID. If the administration wants to address the family uh, uh, issue in, in the ACA, come back to Congress. Let's have that conversation. I, I don't believe the budget does anything to address the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, and under the Speaker's plan, at least 342 fewer drugs will enter America's market for our patients over the next decade. Uh, even Health Subcommittee Chairman Mr. Dawkins noted the partisan insulin bill 
uh, is no help whatsoever and doesn't reduce the actual cost of insulin by one penny. I agree we need real solutions. We should work together to lower medicine costs with the bipartisan lower costs, more cures act. And I'll finish with this uh, beyond my time. Go ahead. I'm very troubled on the administration's unprecedented action to limit coverage of Alzheimer's treatments, ignoring the FDA's gold standard of approval in basically singling out a whole range of drugs tied to Alzheimer's will have a chilling effect on other innovative medical breakthroughs. And that's terrible news for patients desperate for new treatments. With that, I will enter the rest of my statement into the record, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and I look forward to the discussion today, Mr. Secretary. So ordered. It's now my uh, pleasure to welcome back our witness, the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Mr. Secretary, your statement will be made part of the record in its entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you with that time, please keep an eye on the timer that is in front of you. I will notify you when that time has expired. Mr. Secretary, please proceed. Chairman Neal, uh, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the President's FY 2023 budget. Great to be back in this chamber. Uh, let me begin by mentioning that, uh, as Chairman Neal mentioned, that today hundreds of millions of Americans have gotten vaccinated. The chairman mentioned how many have been fully vaccinated, some 219 million. Some 257 million Americans have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine and two-thirds of adults over the age of 65 have gotten a booster shot. We've also closed the glaring gap in vaccine rates across communities that have often been left behind. It has paid dividends to heat common sense and surge resources, including tests and treatments, to our hardest hit and highest risk communities. 340 million free COVID-19 at-home tests shipped across America, 270 million free N95 masks, 100 million booster doses, almost $186 billion in provider relief fund distributed through more than 800,000 payments to over 441,000 providers for COVID losses and expenses. That's 441,000 hospitals, community health centers, doctors, pharmacies, nursing homes, rural health clinics, behavioral health providers, and other health, health care providers. Real money, real relief, real results. Beyond COVID-19, today more Americans have insurance for their health care than ever before. That includes a record-breaking 14.5 million Americans who secured health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. Many of those insured Americans are paying less than $10 per month in premiums for that solid insurance coverage and the peace of mind that comes with it. I'm also pleased that today the FDA is issuing two proposed tobacco product standards, one prohibiting menthol as a flavor in cigarettes and another prohibiting all flavors in cigars. These standards are based on scientific evidence and would improve the health of Americans. In addition, we launched Operation uh, Allies Welcome, an HHS-led effort that has helped over 68,000 of our Afghan brothers and sisters resettle as refugees here in America. And we have begun to extend support to Ukrainian refugees fleeing the Russian invasion of their homeland. We're coordinating nearly $300 million with our 50 states, tribal governments, and territories to prepare for the launch of the new three-digit 988 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline this July. What 911 is for local emergencies, we're har working hard to make 988 for Americans experiencing a mental or behavioral health crisis. HHS has also made key investments to close holes in our public health system in areas like maternal health, where we've extended Medicaid coverage for postpartum care for a new mother and her baby from two months to 12 months. We recently awarded $16 million to community health organizations to expand HHS's maternal and child home visiting program. And we are working across agencies to make more children eligible for high quality early education programs like Head Start. The President's 2023 budget lets us build on that record of common sense and unprecedented investment in Americans' health. It proposes $127 billion in discretionary budget authority and $1.7 trillion in mandatory funding, including a standout and historic investment to transform the mental health infrastructure in our country, a priority I know you share. 
It also asked for $82 billion for the President's pandemic preparedness proposal to get ready for whatever might come next after COVID-19. Considering that COVID has cost our country more than $4.5 trillion in direct support from the federal government so far, this is a no-brainer to continue fighting COVID-19 and prepare for any future pandemic. The funding we're requesting will be end-to-end -end for research, development, approvals, deployment, and effective response. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, this budget turns hardship into hope, inclusion into opportunity. I look forward to working with you to make it a reality and to continue our efforts to give Americans real relief, real results, and real peace of mind. With that, I'd be more than welcome to, uh, willing to answer any questions. Well, let me commend you, Mr. Secretary, and the Department for your work on the Affordable Care Act. In the 12 years since its passage, the ACA has helped dramatically reduce the number of uninsured, not just in Massachusetts, but across the nation. We in Massachusetts now have universal coverage. The ACA has improved our health care system, it's protected people with pre-existing conditions, and reduced the number of uninsured Americans by approximately 20 million people. In last year's American Rescue Plan, Democrats enacted the first major expansion of ACA subsidies, making coverage, as you noted, even more affordable for those truly in need. Those critical provisions originated right here in this committee, of which we are immensely proud. Mr. Secretary, can you talk about the impact the American Rescue Plan had on lowering health care costs for millions of Americans, as well as your efforts in the Department that are now underway to boost enrollment and further improve affordability? Mr. Chairman, uh, we could take the full time of the hearing to discuss all the things that you and your colleagues made possible through the American Rescue Plan. The fact that uh, today Americans can afford a health insurance plan under the Affordable Care Act, you all took care of that cliff that existed for middle class Americans who were trying to secure insurance, who found themselves simply because they may have gotten a, a, a small raise in their salary, all of a sudden disqualified for some of the subsidies that helped them afford their health insurance. You made it possible for those millions of Americans to stay on coverage. You made it possible for us to extend Medicaid to millions of other Americans who were lacking health insurance, even though they worked hard but earned very little. Uh, you can continue to see the results in the efforts under COVID to try to reach out to everyone in every part of the community. I'll, and I'll close with one last point on this. When I became secretary about a year or so ago, I got the numbers, uh, I get daily reports on where we are on COVID. At around that time, this is late April or so, uh, I was told that about 55%, uh, well, no, excuse me, about two thirds of white Americans had already got at least one shot of the vaccine at that point. A little over half of black Americans, a little over half of Latino Americans had done the same. That disparity could not continue because we, we were seeing deaths in certain communities far greater than we should. We made an effort to go out there and reach those communities. Because of the American Rescue Plan, we had the resources to go to people instead of waiting for them to come to us. Today, I'm pleased to report that the rate of vaccination for white Americans is over 80%. The rate of vaccination for black Americans is over 80%. The rate of vaccination for Latinos is over 80 percent. The same for Asian Americans and Native Americans as well. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Just before I recognize Mr. Brady, I want to, uh, without objection, remind members that they will be recognized for four minutes so that everybody will have a chance this morning uh, to question our witness. Consistent with committee practice in these remote settings, we will dispense with the Gibbons rule and we will go in order of seniority, switching between majority and minority members. Let me now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I have two questions. And I want to start, I think, looking back on my career in Congress, I've been really blessed. One of the things I'm proudest of, and I think the most consequential, is the work this committee did, Democrats and Republicans together, to end the surprise medical bills across America. I think it's so key, the work that we did, and, um, you know, I'm really troubled about HHS's rollout of this landmark law. We were very careful, and again, I'm proud of the work that the Chairman and I did and our members, craft a bill that didn't set rates for payment of out-of-the-network services. We established and set a level playing field that didn't tip the scales, uh, and a lot of people wanted the scales to be tipped uh, uh, in a way that, uh, uh, that it either tipped it to the patient's health plan or their provider. And if we'd have gotten that wrong, patients would have suffered through more narrow networks and reduced access to care. So after an initial HHS rule that missed the mark by a wide margin, 
in my view, did exactly the opposite of the clear letter of the law. The courts have acted and corrected the rule to reflect the balanced process included in the law that we passed. So can you tell us now why, after Texas District Court's judge ruling, the administration intends to continue delaying the, the implementation, wasting resources, appealing this decision, and a pursuing approach that, in my view, flies directly in the face of the law that Congress passed. Congressman, first let me say thank you for the opportunities you and the Chairman have extended to discuss the No Surprises Act. I know how important it has been to you and members, actually all members in the House and Senate have mentioned this to me. Uh, we will continue to uh, speak to stakeholders uh, and talk to members of Congress. We're in the process of trying to issue the final uh, rule that will implement the law. We're going to uh, continue to enforce where we can in accordance with the court rulings that we've had issued. And what we're going to try to do is continue to keep patients out of that food fight that exists sometimes between the providers and the, uh, the insurers so that every patient knows that once they see their medical bill, they won't be surprised when they get home, uh, won't get broadsided by some additional medical bill that they were not expecting. So we'll look forward to working with you and appreciate the guidance that you all have offered. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And, and, and my advice would be don't wait for the court's process. We wouldn't be in court if the rule had been written to the letter of the law. So the sooner we uh, implement this together, and this is one of those issues we've worked together beautifully in a bipartisan way. We're eager to work with you uh, on implementation on this, what is, I think, a historic landmark and bipartisan bill. Second, very quickly, um, Last year, HHS announced the largest premium increase in Medicare history. And in January, you instructed CMS to reassess the premiums for 2022. Yet, to date, no one at the agency has been able to answer our questions or give us any more details about the potential changes. And we understand from the hearing yesterday, uh, you, you noted the agency continues to work on the reassessment. So, we're nearly a third of the way through 2022. Where specifically are we in the process? of changing premiums, what's your timeline on announcing it, and, and how do you plan on implementing that change? Uh, Congressman, great questions, because those are questions I have posed to CMS over the last several months as we've tried to make uh, a full uh, determination of any action we take after the initial actuarial determination on, on Aduhome, which is the, uh, the drug the, that has caused the need for the redetermination to exist because of the high price and the changes in the price and the actions taken by CMS when it came to how, what kind of coverage it would get under Medicare. What I can tell you is that uh, the actuary has essentially come close to completing the work done on the pricing element of Aduhelm. We now have the redetermination, uh, excuse me, the determination of national coverage that was made by CMS that also differs from what the actuary expected back in the fall of last year. And so we are now asking the actuaries to take a close look at that so we can get a final count on where we stand given that Aduhelm uh, has changed in character from when it was first considered by the actuaries way back in August, September. Given all that, do you expect an announcement on those um, pricing changes to be within 60 days, within 90 days, what is, what, obviously you're working toward a timetable. What do you, can you give us some, some insight into that? Congressman Brady, I, I think we will, within HHS, be uh, a, approaching the conclusions probably somewhere in that timeline. The difficulty is any action will, will include more than just HHS, CMS action. So, for example, uh, if we were to go through the process of saying to uh, Americans under Medicare that we're going to make adjustments, that would be done through a process that would have to include Social Security because they're the ones that would issue any changes in checks. So it's a process that would include more than us, but everyone is waiting for CMS to give us that final outcome so we can then see what it, what it triggers. Do you expect from your side a 60 to 90 day timetable is reasonable for an announcement? I would say yes, uh, and I have asked CMS to uh, give us a clear sense of within HHS when we could move because, as I said, there are other stakeholders that, that would be involved in the process. So we're trying to move it, but what we're trying to do is make sure that whatever the uh, outcome is, it, it, 
we could live with it and go with it instead of have to go through another readjustment. Understand, and you were very generous. Thank you. Time. Mr. Brady, uh, let me say, uh, Mr. Secretary, as well, that I share Mr. Brady's view on surprise billing, and I anticipate and hope that the Ways and Means position will prevail. So we'll be continue to work with you as we have on this issue as it's interpreted. Now let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. As you know from our discussion, I remain very concerned about the outrageous price of pharmaceuticals. And at a time when so many Americans are concerned about a wide range of price increases, uh, this Congress is frankly just incapable of overcoming the power of big pharma to pass any meaningful price negotiation legislation. Uh, indeed, uh, your testimony refers to the only measure, which is a cap on insulin which does not lower the price of insulin by a penny, though it does shift who pays for uh, insulin. Uh, I think there are so many things that this administration could do on its own uh, to address predatory pricing. And just to give you one example that I think you're familiar with, you could simply hold a hearing on a petition regarding the price of Extandi, a prostate cancer drug that cost $190,000 for a single year of treatment for prostate cancer, six times what Japanese patients pay. Uh, this hearing, uh, which has been requested, could permit experts to come forward and discuss the monopoly prices and the investment that taxpayers have made. The global sales for Extandi are more than $20 billion, half of them here in the United States, yet for the 250,000 men who are diagnosed each year with prostate cancer, they face astronomical cost. Uh, on this, on the ability of the administration to institute reasonable pricing clauses in government contracts, on greater transparency on how taxpayer dollars are spent on R&D and procurement, on your authority uh, with regard to reasonable prices on critical drugs for hepatitis C and other drugs, there are things this administration could do and do now and a strategy of simply saying we're waiting to see what Congress will do is not a strategy that addresses the pain that American consumers of pharmaceuticals face now. So I just urge you to go back and, and talking to your colleagues and say, let's do something to show we care and that we don't want to end this administration the way the Trump administration did with great talk about this and no action. Now, you have a request for us for $10 billion more dollars uh, for the kind of uh, COVID relief that is so very important. I've supported that in the past. But I do have question about how that $10 billion will be spent. Uh, is it correct that about half of it is, uh, according to some reports, is allocated to just one drug from Pfizer? Congressman, we're going to try to make use of the $10 billion to provide uh, both vaccines and therapeutics uh, to meet the needs that we expect to have over the next several months. Uh, that can be dialed depending on what we see happening, but we are going to devote most of that money to With vaccines With the limitations and that you face, how does a price get set on a vaccine or a therapeutic like the one I understand half this money will go to for Pfizer? It's, it's a very similar process to what you've mentioned, which is uh, the federal government will begin negotiations with those manufacturers to try to see what type of production they can uh, provide and what, at what price. As Much you know, of it, again, I'm depends on the, the, the level of production uh, to determine the price. And in terms of the provisions uh, that are made about price uh, and the interest the government has in uh, the intellectual property, uh, Will you work to see that future contracts uh, concerning pharmaceuticals are designed in a way that the public can know what its rights are and what price is paid? Congressman, uh, th this is an issue where uh, when I used to sit on that, that end, uh, I also uh, did as much to advocate for as well. And I can tell you that it will be my effort to ensure that to the degree that we negotiate new contracts with these manufacturers, we will do everything we can to have transparency in the process. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good seeing you again. Uh, the President's budget has no plan to save Medicare, which is expected to go broke or 16 percent or 18 percent cuts in four years. I represent 240,000 seniors, the fifth most senior district 
uh, frankly, in the, in the country. So Medicare becoming insolvent is unacceptable to me, and I'm sure every member up here. What, are you, what, do, what is the administration or yourself doing to take a look at this? Because being in business myself for a lot of years, 30 years before I got, we used to build five-year plans, three to five-year plans, business models, and you've got to be looking at this and thinking about how this is going to get dressed, addressed. And it's not just one party, but we clearly need to look at it. And I'm very concerned about where that's going. That's the 800-pound grill in my mind, the room. We can talk about all these other things, but Medicare you know, on the verge of uh, going broke in three to four years is not acceptable. What's your thoughts? Congressman, first, uh, I, I think you're right. These will be bipartisan solutions. In the President's budget, there are efforts to move towards what we call value-based uh, uh, care, which is based not on how many times you go visit a doctor, but on getting the best results and making sure down the chain of doctors that you're getting the best care so that's a good outcome that saves you money. We're also in intent to working with you to make sure that if we're going to do reform to Medicare, uh, what we're doing is we're cutting costs, not benefits. And so any time we talk about moving forward on Medicare, we have to make sure we're talking we're in a bipartisan way talking about But have you taken costs, any initiative or anything in terms of the, the administration or your, or your department to take a look at what we might do or some suggestions, some ideas? Uh, and, and I'll go ahead. Well, as I said, part of it is moving the system towards rewarding doctors who provide value versus volume of care. And if you do that, instead of paying for five different visits to the same doctor, you're paying for only the visits necessary for the care. It's the outcome that will matter, not the number of times you visit. I, I think we've got to take it serious. Otherwise, in my mind, it's malpractice. We have to find a way to start looking at this and dealing with it. The other thing I wanted to mention in terms of, you know, fraud and waste and all that, they claim, and I'd like to get your number, that close to $70, $80 billion of fraud in Medicare is that your understanding, 60 to $80 billion in fraud of the $700 billion or so that uh, gets spent? I don't know if there's an exact number. What I could tell you is that we continue to find fraud in the system. We have a program integrity uh, initiative where we are going after those, especially in the nursing home setting, where we find that the taxpayers are being billed more than they should. We find also that there are what's called upcoding. In some cases, uh, an insurer provider will increase the kind of level of care that they claim to have well, provided to give We're short money. on time. But, you know, this fraud issue has been going on as long as I've been on the committee, 10, 12 years or something like that. It seemed like there's little or nothing that's been done. We've got to find a way to, you know, if you want to look to make it viable long term, there's some low hanging fruit. There's got to be a better way uh, that we can address the fraud and what's going on in terms of Medicare. I think it's completely uh, malfeasance again. I, when I was the Attorney General in California, we worked closely with the federal government, HHS, in going after some of that fraud. It's out there. It's, it's harder to find than you think sometimes, but when we do, it, it goes deeper than sometimes. It seems think. like that's definitely an area we can work on a bipartisan basis. Absolutely. But we got to get on it. It's, we've been, it's been talked about for 10 years. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. And my good friend, Mr. Uh, Secretary Becerra, welcome back to the uh, committee. Um, uh, like uh, Chairman Neal, uh, there's uh, good news coming out of uh, Connecticut and in my district. Uh, I'll bet everybody on the committee has an anecdotal story, but when someone gets up in a town hall setting and says, I was paying $1,300 a month for my health care premiums. Now I'm paying $20 a month for those premiums. He said, and with the savings that I have, I now can look optimistically to the future about putting aside the money I'm going to need to educate my two daughters. These are the kind of everyday anecdotal stories that we hear that have come from enhancing the Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, work uh, that you've been actively involved in, both when you were in Congress and now in your uh, position as, as Secretary. My question, very direct and simple, in dealing with uh, the increase of inflation, uh, and that especially hits hardest our people on fixed incomes. Uh, 
And uh, what is, uh, in your estimation, the impact of extending enhanced affordable care tax care credits uh, on house everyday household budgets? Congressman, it's the stories you just mentioned. I, in fact, I was in Connecticut when I heard some of these stories from some families as well. There was a mother who mentioned how she actually had more resources now to do more activity with her young children as a result of the tax credits that were being extended. Very simple things, but very important to her children to be able to do a little bit more with them. Uh, it is that kind of real impact that's made a difference for those millions. There are, of those 14 and a half million Americans who are on health insurance coverage through the Affordable Care Act, there is no doubt that millions of them are there because of the extended credits that they got that didn't kick them off or have them fall over the cliff and lose that coverage. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. My colleagues would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Social Security when I had a mic in front of me. So I wanted to uh, make sure that, uh, uh, as I know you're aware of, uh, et cetera, that uh, this pandemic and people on fixed incomes has, has hit the elderly especially hard. And the people that are uh, impacted the most during this pandemic have been uh, the elderly because they're most susceptible to inflation because they are predominantly the ones on fixed incomes. And in as much as Congress, not the executive branch, not the legislative branch, is responsible for enhancing Social Security, uh, I'm uh, proud to say the work of our subcommittee and the work of the chairman of this committee is moving forward to help lift people out of poverty. Uh, more than three million of our fellow Americans, mostly women, get below poverty level checks from the government, a government that found time to give the wealthiest amongst us major tax cuts, but hasn't looked inwardly to Amera and said, hey, we're long overdue more than 50 years since Congress has done anything for Social Security. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us here today. Uh, some important topics, uh, certainly it's already been mentioned, the, the Medicare solvency issue. Uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's like some things uh, have changed, some things remain the same since you were here uh, just a, a year ago. Uh, I was disappointed, I, I, I too was disappointed to see the, the budget not address the Medicare issue that we know is, is very important, not even mentioned in the budget. Now more specifically, you know, the, the Medicare trustees report uh, it actually issued, and, and you're a, a trustee as well, uh, a Medicare funding warning which requires the president to submit to Congress proposed legislation to respond to the warning within 15 days of the submission uh, of the budget. Now, we know it's been a month since the budget was released, so it's impossible to meet that 15-day deadline, but uh, will he meet that requirement, or ha have you indicated uh, as such uh, the need to, to meet that requirement? Congressman, at this stage, uh, there has not been any action to, to move in that direction. Okay. Well, certainly, I, I hope that we can uh, certainly abide by the, the trustees' uh, very diligent work. Uh, I, and there's, I think, opportunity to work together on that. And so I hope we can uh, head in that direction. Um, I think it's uh, obvious that Operation Warp Speed has been very effective. And now we're able to talk about post-pandemic. We're, we're not all the way out of it, but we are uh, able to talk about uh, a post-pandemic future um, rather than just uh, wishful thinking. So uh, on the transition phase, I, I'm concerned that little in the, in the budget actually seems to indicate that besides a diminishing uh, need for certain COVID-specific resources, there, there just aren't, aren't other things uh, obvious. Uh, when you were here last year, I talked about telehealth and how important that is to expanded access for everyone. I was working on that for rural purposes before the pandemic. We know that the need is greater than uh, uh, just for rural purposes. So we know uh, many people are depending on this and telehealth as well is not included in the budget and I'm concerned about that. So we're actually going to now see a, a cliff of sorts 
uh, because uh, the deadlines or the expirations and sunsets uh, on, on telehealth. So uh, while some limited provisions received a 151-day extension past the end of the public health emergency in the FY22 omnibus passed last month, uh, it's obviously an extremely short window, and it left out critical flexibilities essential to run even rural and underserved providers uh, in the telehealth arena. Is the lack of attention to the post-pandemic telehealth in the budget because you believe that the provisions in the omnibus are adequate, or what would you say is, is the, the, the posture there? Congressman, first, I agree with you that uh, that extension of time, the five-month extension for those authorities on telehealth, indispensable, especially in rural communities, underserved communities. We hope that uh, we can continue to work with you to actually extend those authorities because we will need statutory changes to make that possible. Um, if you take a close look at the President's budget, you'll see that he actually does address how to move forward. It's that plan that I mentioned before. It speaks not only to COVID, but beyond COVID and the preparation we need. We hope okay. you'll take a close look where you do need that, that re those resources. Okay, so would you say the administration does support extending the, the telehealth provisions, especially for critical access hospitals? We've already indicated absolute support for extending some of those provisions. Uh, many of them have to be worked on because you know that there's some issues. For example, moving across state lines, there are issues there be among states on how you do that. But we absolutely do believe that we have to keep some of those telehealth authorities in place. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back to the committee, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you to Oregon next week. I uh, hope you'll in, enjoy that visit. Um, I appreciate your reference to the budget that has been proposed by the President, and I look forward to working with you and the committee to be able to parse out those elements, because I think there are a number of things that really have broad bipartisan support, they make sense, and they meet the needs of the American public. Last year, we made historic investments in the American Rescue Plan to lift people out of, uh, away from a crisis at a, a horrific, horrific time. Um, and as we continue to build back from the pandemic, it's clear that our health care system requires continued support to meet the needs of the American public. But I think it's important um, that it's not just enough to spend money. And we've talked a little bit about this in the past in terms of what steps we can take to be able to focus and get more value out of what we expend. We need to make investments to create long-term changes that better meet the needs of the current moment, improve people's access to care, and produces better outcomes. It's no secret that our health care is expensive. Without the policies like increasing the ACA premiums, the average monthly premium last year would have been 53 percent higher. I agreed that that was an important step, but subsidization alone is not the answer. And it does not negate the fact that health care spending accounts for merely tw nearly 20 percent of the GDP. I appreciate the ranking member referring to the waiver process uh, taking place in Texas. And I, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. I hope that there are ways to enable other states to implement innovative solutions to lower costs using Section 115 or uh, 1332. My own state of Oregon, which you will be visiting, uh, enacted a waiver process to implement per capita growth uh, spending limits, meeting quality standards and the metrics, and it ended up saving more than a billion dollars for the federal government in, in excess of the waiver amount, and it continues to provide those savings. Secretary, I wonder if there's a way that we can work together to explore what the administration could do using the waiver process. I know it's a priority also of my Oregon colleague, Senator Wyden, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Is there an area that we can move forward to further enhance the utilization of those waivers? Congressman, first, great to see you, and absolutely, I believe there are ways to use those waiver authorities. I would uh, urge you to take a look at what your neighbor state to your south, uh, my home state of California, is doing when it comes to those 1115 waivers. 
uh, in trying to uh, expand its access to care through the Medicaid program. Uh, I would also point out to you that in the President's budget where he makes an unprecedented investment in behavioral health, mental health, substance use disorder, uh, we are calling for more focus at a community level. So it's not just the major institutions that offer uh, someone who needs mental health care uh, the support, but you can actually get it far closer to home and hopefully in some cases uh, be in a community setting where you can stay home. And so we're going to try to expand access if we can work with you to get the resources to make that possible. Well, I look forward to exploring what you're doing in California. I know there's interest in Nevada, the state of Washington, and Utah. And I think it's an opportunity for us to be able to contain costs and improve care. And I look forward to being able to explore that with you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, to inquire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I got four minutes, so I'll just get right to it. Um, I, I have to follow up on my colleague from, Kansas, uh, from um, Mr. Smith's inquiry about the, the warning on Medicare. Uh, you're a trustee. You're well aware of the statutory requirements. You've served on this uh, committee. And, and I just found your response to that inquiry very, very, very enlightening. Essentially, how I interpreted your testimony was, we're well aware uh, at HHS uh, of the requirement, and as a trustee for the Medicare system, that we have a 15-day requirement statutorily on us, and we're going to ignore it. We are not going to move in that direction, I guess, was the sum and substance of your response. That is very troublesome to me as a member of Congress, to hear from a, an executive branch agency that is well aware of a statutory obligation to come up with a solution for what is a glooming crisis on the horizon with Medicare insolvency, and, and the, the response from the administration is, we know we're supposed to come up with a plan, but we're going to ignore it. Did I interpret your response uh, accurately? Congress said, no, you did not. Fascinating to me. And that's why I love this theater uh, that we're in. And you've been in this chamber many, many years, and you, had, uh, you, you have my respect uh, as a member of Congress, and, uh, and I appreciate the candor uh, in that response and I'm sure that will be handled elsewhere. But I want to get to a question that my friend from Texas, Mr. Doggett, uh, which I agree with in regards to the cost of health care. Uh, I'm a father of a type 1 diabetic, so insulin cost is very interesting to me. And the best you have in your proposal, in your testimony, to deal with costs is we will work to lower the cost of prescription drugs, such as by capping the cost of insulin at $35 per month. I interpret that as inaccurate. You're doing nothing to lower costs. I agree with my colleague from Texas, Mr. Doggett. All you're doing is capping the expense on who pays it, who is the, the patient, the recipient, like my son. The bottom line I have for you is, is that the best you got? Is we're going to use the federal government's authority just to cap cost and not actually get to the actual cost issue? That's the best this administration's coming up with to solve this problem? Congressman, if you would unshackle the restraint you place on us by law uh, in being able to negotiate prices, like for insulin, we could do far better. But we have to work with the authorities that you give us. Okay. You know this, I know so this. Let me, let, me, let me just inquire as to your understanding. What, what is the actual cost of a vial of insulin? It is far less than what's being charged. What's the amount? Congressman, it'd be nice to know, but the transparency that we It's about $300 a vial. As, as a parent? That's what you think it is, but even you don't know because we don't have the transparency to really go in and dig to find out what it truly costs. Okay, and, and that's exactly my point. To, so the best, the, you, can, the best you come up with is we're going to cap the cost at $35. Because the laws, as you know, Congress, you know, I know this because I was where you are, we don't have the authorities to go in and do these things the way we'd like. Give us the authority to negotiate drug prices. Give us the authority to find out behind the curtain what's going on. You don't have the authority to figure out what it costs to manufacture uh, an actual vial of insulin day to day. You don't have the resources, the skill set, the education, and that uh, tool under the, your entire agency to figure out what it costs to manufacture a vial of insulin? You're saying because statutorily we can't ask that question of the manufacturers? You've got to be kidding me. Congressman, unless you know some authority that lets me go behind that curtain to find out from you, a drug manufacturer what exactly they, they're charging. So you've had no conversations with any manufacturers as to what it actually costs them to manufacture Numerous. drugs? Numerous. So you've had conversations with them, 
So then what is the actual cost of a vial of insulin? Have you had not, that cost with the manufacturer of insulin? They're not required by law to give us the information. Have they given you any information? They've given us information, but not everything that you've pointed out. I'd be very much interested in looking at that information, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with us, because I, I want to hold them accountable to the actual cost and use the pr power of transparency to get these costs to go down. Thank I the gentleman. My colleague from Texas. Yield back. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kine, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome back. Always a uh, pleasure to see you back at the uh, Home Committee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the Chairman uh, made reference to this in his opening statement, but recently the Committee sent a letter out to health care providers around the country asking them for their plans on reducing their emissions. Um, and it was dated March 24, 2022. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to have it included in the record sure. at this time. You know, in the letter, it does recognize that health, the healthcare industry as a whole is responsible for an estimated 10 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions in the United States and a little over 4 percent globally. So it's not an insignificant amount. And I hope HHS would partner with us to partner with our providers around the country in helping them implement plans or what assistance they need. And I would also suggest the first good stop to make is in my hometown of La Crosse, Wisconsin, with Gunderson Health System that went zero carbon emission with the plan that they implemented. It's a large provider, too, and they're very proud of that accomplishment, and there are best models to be had. But my question to you today is uh, putting on my hat as one of the co-chairs of the Rural Health Caucus, and I have been for a number of years, uh, the workforce shortages that we see throughout the healthcare industry and it's especially acute with the rural providers throughout the country. I've never seen such a dire straits than today. I mean, the, the, the challenge of recruitment and retention, the competition that they face, it's very real. And now with these so-called traveler organizations where businesses are recruiting nurses away from them, paying them a higher wage, and then renting them straight back yep. is driving up their costs as well. You couple that with the with the closure of health care providers, rural hospitals, roughly 140 in the last 10 years alone, about 450 stand on the precipice right now. We face a real challenge with rural health care, and I'm just wondering um, just what you have in response to what more we can be doing to provide them the assistance for the workers they need, but also to keep their doors open. For most of our rural communities, these are the largest employers that we have, too, in rural America. And I've never seen it so dire than today. I, I share your concern. I've been to many of these rural communities and the health centers and hospitals in rural America. You're right, it's tough. Uh, one of the things that we did was we were able to allocate some of the provider relief funds that were meant to compensate providers who provided services to Americans with COVID. Uh, we had a, a, a tranche of that money focused only on rural America to help those providers in rural America. The President's budget provides close to $400 million to increase services into rural uh, communities for those providers because we know so many are on the brink of going under. And so we're trying to do what we can to coordinate some of that rural health care and to access or to provide access, greater access through some of those resources. The final thing I'll mention that I think will be a game changer with your help is that we try, we're going to try to fund more of the slots for doctors, residency programs, in rural health facilities so that you can actually have a doctor, a, a future doctor who's finishing medical school, do his, her residency program, not in the big urban centers where we see all the big uh, hospitals, but in rural America, because we've seen the studies that show that if you get a young, budding physician, nurse, to locate in a particular community and finish your training, chances are they'll stay there. And so that will be a game changer. And finally, I, I've introduced bipartisan legislation with Dr. Burgess uh, for the last few years that would adequately and fairly compensate our pharmacists that are providing a lot of upfront services. Uh, and this would come from Part B, and I would want to share that with you and have the administration take a closer look and ask for your support for it. I think it's one of those neglected holes in our health care system, given the prominence that the pharmacists have have played throughout this COVID crisis and, and what they've had to step up and do on our behalf. I agree, I agree with you. Look forward to working with you because they did step up to the plate. Yeah, thank, thank you, Thank you, the gentleman. Chairman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Uh, I, I do want to go over some things because I think at the end of the day, uh, we start to talk about, uh, about real dollars. And I think it was Everett Dirksen that said, you know, a, a, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. Now it's, it seems to be a trillion here, a trillion there. Now, now we're talking about real money. What, 
Well, I think the thing that's most disturbing about that, I've been told now for 11 years, you can't expect the government to work the way businesses do in the private sector. And I would say it's just the opposite of that. There's no way, there's no way anybody in the private sector can operate the way the government does. As we look at this mounting debt, and I'm trying to understand going into the future, when is enough enough, and at what point do we start to look at what is the return on the investment to the American taxpayer? You and I are both in the same business. You know, it's funded by taxpayers, either their, their revenue each year or the money that we borrow. Uh, there is one thing, though, I, I, I want to point out to you. So my understanding is uh, there's about 80,000 people that work in HHS is it, with, with a $1.8 trillion budget. Uh, the problem I have is that several times I have asked, uh, I've written HHS, uh, and I'll just go over them real quick, and then also, Chairman, I'd like to submit these for the record. Uh, so last year, uh, you and I talked about this in April, and it was uh, Secretary Becerra last April. I sent you this letter requesting a copy of the contract for the emergency intake site established by HHS in Erie, Pennsylvania for unaccompanied children crossing the border. You and I also spoke about it at length at our June budget hearing where you committed to get me an answer in a timely manner. Instead, the department sent me, and I have a copy of the letter, and mostly what it is is thank you, thank you for inquiring. We appreciate that. We'll get back to you at some time in the future. I've never had an answer to it. I also sent a letter. And there's 90-some uh, of our uh, colleagues that are on this letter. Uh, and this has to do something that, that is really, for those of us in the pro-life uh, side of, of this body, Secretary Becerra, as you know, Congress has a long-standing requirement that taxpayer dollars may not be used for abortion. That's why I was disturbed when, in September of last year, I began hearing allegations that the University of Pittsburgh was performing illegal abortions as part of an NIH-funded fetal tissue repository program. Since that time, I have signed on to several letters to you on that topic, including this letter that I led with more than 92 of my colleagues outlining specific data we wanted NIH to, to uh, provide. We've never had a... We've never had a response. Instead, I've had three letters, and this will pretty much sum up where it is. Um, and, and this is from the Department of Health and Human Services, and this is Tara A. Schwartz, uh, who's the acting principal deputy director. Now, why do I bring it up? Because customer service, this is not a complaint department, this is customer service. The way this letter reads, starts off is, Dear Representative Kelly, thank you for your September 21, 2021 letter. Thank you for your October 29th, 2021 letter. And thank you for your letter of December 15th, 2021, regarding your concerns about research at the University of Pittsburgh. The answer was that Pitt... Uh, funded an independent study to find out that they were doing nothing wrong. And what NIH said to me, you should go onto the website if you have any further questions. 80,000 people, almost $2 trillion in the budget, and I get a letter back, thank you for your inquiry. Go to our website to get an answer. That is hardly good customer service. I'm not talking about members of Congress. I'm talking about hardworking American taxpayers who are paying for these services. We do a lot of wonderful things. The government doesn't pay for one damn thing. Taxpayers do. I'm just asking, please, sometime before I expire or you leave office, please get me an answer to these questions I have. It's not me that's asking them, it's constituents asking me to find out for them. It would be great to have that type of a dialogue sometime. Thank you. Whatever the differences of opinion we have here, we don't want the gentleman to expire. <laughs> I actually was, I, I actually was uh, more concerned about me. <laughs> I like Mr. Becerra, but I, I want to be around a, a day longer than him. <laughs> the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell, is recognized to inquire. I'm not going to. Ordered, by the way, on the gentleman's request to have documentation <clears throat> to the record. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back. And uh, I'm, I feel confident with you Jason? at the helm. Jason. And I know you'll give us honest answers. And what you just heard is not a flimsy request out there. There's no call for that. Can't respond. You should. We shouldn't be here. People will make that decision later on. 
uh, in the fiscal year 2023 budget, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced the agency will finally crack down on nursing homes that offer substandard care. I don't know how many times I've read about that or heard of it. You, your predecessor, your predecessor, going back. Most nursing homes are trying to do the right thing. I'm convinced of that. But according to recent research from NYU, nursing homes owned by private equity firms offer declining standards and lower quality care. And these firms had increased infections and deaths from the COVID-19, according to a report by Americans for Financial Reform. We must hold bad actors financially accountable. Fortunately, your agency released a trove of new data on hospital and nursing home ownership. How will this new data inform the administration's goals to crack down on poorly performing nursing homes? What else will the administration do with this data? Congressman, first, thank you for being a bulldog on this issue, because I remember being on this committee and also trying to fight for better disclosure and accountability. Having that data helps us sniff out where the bad actors are. This helps those who are doing the research, those who are trying to do some of the investigative work. When I was at AG in California, we would rely on some of the data to help us go to the right places to sniff out the, the bad actors. And this should help us have a greater force in working towards finding those who are the bad actors within the industry. But it's, it's, like, it's almost like the opiate problem where we caught the bad actors and nothing happened. I mean, we've got to have some way of financial discipline here or else we're just talking hot air. That's the point I'm trying to make. Our vulnerable citizens, our seniors, grandmothers, aunts, uncles. Secondly, tragically, the destruction of Ukraine continues the President has reminded us that aiding Ukrainians is an international responsibility, but the damage to our resettlement programs caused by the previous administration, this is a fact, ensured our nation only resettled 11,411 individuals the last fiscal year. As of March the 31st of this year, we have only resettled 8,738 people. That's a disgrace. So we're talking out of both sides of our mouths. We want to help this country that's been attacked, a sovereign nation. Now, I applaud the administration in its efforts to streamline resettlement for Ukrainian citizens and reunite families does the administration need additional resources to meet the goal of 100, of resettling 100,000 Ukrainians and the 125,000 from the rest of the world? Mr. Chairman, if I could just Yes, let the, I'm going to let the gentleman respond, please. So just today, uh, I think it is now public, we have submitted to Congress our request for a Ukrainian supplemental, which will include funding to help resettle uh, among those 100,000 Ukrainians that we expect to come in as refugees. And the only other thing I wanted to point out, Congressman, is that you didn't include that 68,000 refugees from Afghan that we helped resettle over the past year when you gave that count. So we have actually far greater work that's been done in helping refugees resettle in this country in the last year. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to write to uh, the Secretary concerning protecting access to labs also. We've got to do something about this. Okay. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. Um, on February 18th, several members of this committee and myself sent a, a letter to the CMS Administrator, Brooks LeSure, 
on a decision to add anti-racism plans as a quality metric under the physician fee schedule starting in 2024. Your agency to this point uh, has not responded to our letter, so I wanna ask you a few questions. Mr. Secretary, yes or no, do you believe that an anti-racism plan should be more important to a physician than managing medications prior to surgery so that patients don't die on the surgical table? Congressman, I have got to ask this question yesterday. If you can point to me where we, there is an so-called anti-racism plan, I can respond, but we are, we're, what we're doing is Mr. trying Chairman, to Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record. Um, this fee schedule that CMS has offered as a rule from November. So ordered. And, and can I, Congressman, is, can I ask you to read what the title of that is? Yes, um, if I had my glasses. Uh, it is 40, 42 CFR parts 403, 405, 410, 411, 414, 415, 423, 424, and 425. It came out from your CMS on November 21st, 2021. You gave a lot of numbers. You didn't say what the programs were. It, it's the physician fee schedule. And, and you pointed out to a some form of plan, and what I'm saying to you, there is no such plan as you've described, so it's difficult. I'll reclaim my time. Um, you didn't answer yes or no. Um, it's not a yes or no question. It, yeah, I, I asked a question that was yes or no, so I, I think a question it quite about a plan that doesn't exist. So you're saying it does not exist? Not what you've described. So there's no anti-racism plans that's part of a physician fee schedule that came out through rules from CMS? Congressman, respectfully, show me. Are you, Mr. Secretary, your secretary of CMS, is there a physician fee schedule that came out that has any content of weighted measures for anti-racism? There is a fee schedule that takes into account that we have great disparity in this country in accessing health care and moving towards a system that will make sure anyone has equal access to the care that they are entitled to. And in that fee schedule, does it put separate weights for various aspects of care based on one's race? Based solely on one's race? No. We'll be happy to even provide, we would not even be having this interchange, Mr. Secretary, if your department would respond to letters that we have sent. Congress would accurately describe what we're doing and it's easier to answer questions. I, Mr. Secretary, I'll be happy to provide the fact that the CMS has issued a fee schedule in November that weights anti-racism activities to have more preference over one being diagnosed for cancer, one being diagnosed of what drugs they should have before surgery is unacceptable. The most important things to every physician should be providing high quality care to every patient, Mr. Secretary. Politics should be the furthest thing from a physician's mind. Shamefully, under your agency, politics, not medicine, will take center stage at the doctor's office. Under this new measure, Mr. Secretary, you have adopted quality assessment of patient care provided by physicians will be directly linked to the implementation of anti-racism plans. Specifically, HHS will encourage clinicians to perform clinic-wide reviews of existing tools and policies such as value statements or clinical practice guidelines to ensure that they include and are aligned with the commitment to anti-racism. Mr. Chairman, I think that's unacceptable. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to allow the Secretary to answer, if you would like. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, I, I respect the position you take. I think it's unfortunate that too much misinformation and disinformation is put out there on what's being done. That's what confuses Americans. I respect that you may have a different position in trying to attack the disparities that exist for people accessing care. We'll work with you on, on these uh, programs, but what we won't accept is someone trying to mischaracterize what we're trying to do. Thank and you, gentlemen. Yeah. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for joining us, Mr. Secretary. As a matter of fact, it has been our pleasure to have you visit with us in Chicago, yes. and for that, we're most appreciative. I'm pleased to see the administration's strong support in this budget for many of the priorities I've championed as chair of the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support. I'm pleased that President Biden has included a full five-year reauthorization 
and funding increase for the maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program, which is a key tool to fight maternal mortality and give children a strong, healthy start. As you know, these effective home visiting programs are only reaching a small share of the families that could benefit from them because of funding limitations, which is why we have proposed several times to double funding. Can you speak more about the administration's commitment to home visiting and plans to work with the committee on a bipartisan basis to ensure that we enact a timely reauthorization and are able to double funding for this important investment? Congressman, thank you for the question, and especially uh, after the exchange I had with Congressman Smith, and I, I, I hope this helps address some of the uh, concerns that were raised. Home visits have been proven to increase better outcomes for families. Unfortunately, unlike perhaps you and me, we've been able to afford health insurance for a long time. Lots of families haven't. And the result is that they are, when they come finally to a provider, they come presenting with worse health conditions. The more we're able to get to them early, the earlier we can attack any health conditions they may have. These home visits, whether for a senior, whether for a child, have real results. And what we do see is that more often than not, the people who don't have good access to care come from low-income communities, oftentimes minority communities. So we're going to do everything we can to tackle that hurdle because no one should go without care, regardless of your race, your, your creed, uh, your place of uh, residency, and so these home care vi home visits are crucial. And let me ask you, the University of Chicago has issued a report that shows that African American women in Chicago have a 45 percent higher mortality rate than the rest of the state. Are there things that the department is doing to specifically deal with the high morbidity rate of black women, not only in Chicago, but throughout the country. You point in, out another area where in our country, uh, as rich and as uh, advanced as we are, we have rates of maternal morbidity and mortality that compare to some of the developed world. Again, it's not an issue of trying to have physicians, any individual physician, do something differently. It's about getting a healthcare system to target what we know needs to be done to help communities. And one of the areas is maternal health. We are expanding access to care for women so that when they do deliver, it's a healthy birth and that they can continue moving forward with their child. If we succeed in getting um, all states to buy into the program where maternal health will be expanded under Medicaid from 60 days to 365 days, guaranteed we're going to help a lot of families, not just black families, but a lot of families. <coughs> we're going to continue to move in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, I, I want to talk about the opioid epidemic in this country. Last year, for the first time, 100,000 Americans died from opioid abuse. The, uh, the administration has apparently no plan to deal with uh, opioids coming across our southern border. Last year, over 10,000 pounds of fentanyl were seized. Uh, that's, th that's more than the past three years combined and 90% of it was seized on our southern border. It's irrefutable that the, uh, these drugs are coming across our southern border. It is a terrible health crisis in South Carolina. 1,734 people died from drug overdoses in 2020, a 53% increase from 2019. And if you look at the chart of drug overdose deaths in this country, it goes straight up from the 1990s until today, except for about two or three years when President Trump took office and actually tried to secure our southern border. And another thing that bothers me about this is you want to declare the, the pandemic over at the southern border and, and do away with uh, Title 42 that keeps people in Mexico while they're applying for asylum, yet you want to keep the uh, pandemic in place when you sue for 
uh, enforcing mask mandates on planes than for allowing people not to pay their student loans. So which is it? What I, what I want to know is what is this administration's plan to address the life-threatening opioid epidemic in this country? And I want to add one other thing. In, my, in and around my district, in the first quarter of this year, there's been over 100 shootings. Now, if you talk to the law enforcement agents in my di district, the overwhelming majority of those is from drugs and, and gang activity. And, and this administration allowing the cartels to control our southern border, and these gangs are spreading from Mexico throughout our country. And it is one of the major causes of increase in violent crime. And it is, uh, it is astonishing that this administration would want to end Title 42 and would want to put Americans at health risk for diseases coming across our southern border and also for the incredible increase in violent crime. Mr. Secretary, what is the administration's plan to deal with this? Congressman, first let me uh, begin by agreeing with you that having 100,000 Americans die from overdose, uh, that was the latest number we had. I think it's based in 19, I mean 2020 numbers. That's, that's unacceptable. And as you will see in the President's budget. Well, saying it and doing something about it are two different things, Mr. Secretary. It oh. appears to me that the administration is encouraging it more than trying to uh, 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 stop it. Congressman, then let, let me uh, suggest that you take a look at the projects we've undertaken. We is initiated a new drug strategy because we saw how many people were dying. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to prevent people. You mean from like trying to eliminate Title 42 so that people can come across our border? Is that what you mean? Well, if you want me to move, uh, let me move off of the work that we're doing to prevent, treat, uh, pr provide assistance to those who are uh, uh, facing drug addiction uh, and talk about the issue of Title 42. First, I'm very, I'm saddened to hear that you are disparaging the work that our border agents and custom agents do on the border to try to protect America from the infiltration. I, 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 I am all for our border agents. What I'm against well, is, they're the, ones that do the, work, is sir. the administration you just said cutting the job. knees out from under these people and not letting them do their jobs. Well, I believe they're trying to do everything they can to uh, stop the infiltration of drugs into this country. And they're doing the work in, in very courageous ways. Uh, and we should support their efforts to try to keep drugs from coming in. Using Title 42 as an excuse to talk about that is totally uh, inappropriate because I think Title this administration's open border policies are a disaster for the American people. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentle lady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I um, have some questions I would like <laughs> to ask the Secretary, but I feel like based on the last comment of my colleague, we need to clarify a few things. Um, Mr. Secretary, isn't it true that the vast majority of drugs that have come into this country come in through the ports and our waterways, not through our land borders? That's correct. And isn't it true that Title 42 basically deals with pandemic health, uh, health outcomes not, and health challenges, not with drug enforcement? Congress, are not that's, the same. That's absolutely correct. And the people that will be impacted at the border by Title 42 aren't the folks who are trying to ship drugs across the border. Title 42, essentially, the change in Title 42 will affect those who are actually presenting themselves to our border agents, not trying to clandestinely pass by uh, without border agents seeing them or capturing them. And yet there's political capital or hate to be made by trying to link people who are claiming asylum with drug dealers and gangs, but they are not the drug dealers and gangs because they are presenting themselves to law enforcement at the border, correct? That's, that's why I said, again, if people would stop with the misinformation and disinformation, we could have legitimate discussions about border policy, migration policy, or health policy. But I think it's, it's to gain political points to try to essentially link those two issues that are essentially two separate and distinct issues. And um, I, I felt it was important to clarify, I, I thank you, Secretary, um, for informing people with the correct information and not just spewing disinformation that's meant to score cheap political points. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the president's budget for the upcoming fiscal year because it's aligned with many longstanding Democratic priorities, including many that this committee has developed and advanced as part of the American Rescue Plan and the House passed Build Back Better Act. For example, the budget supports extending tax credits 
that helped 350,000 Californians gain health coverage and lowered monthly premiums for another 1.4 million Californians last year. And importantly, the largest gains were among the African-American and Latino communities, two communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic. These are the types of investments we must continue in order to meaningfully reduce the costs weighing heavy, heaviest on working families and to close, close health disparities. And while we've made progress, there is still obviously more that the federal government can do to better support Americans, especially as they age, and particularly when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Early detection is one of the most powerful tools that we have to slow the progression of this debilitating disease. And one of the earliest opportunities for detection is the Medicare annual wellness visit. So under the Affordable Care Act, your annual wellness visit uh, that you are not charged for. Um, and in that visit, we could establish using cog cognitive testing, a baseline for somebody's, um, uh, uh, their cognitive level of reasoning. Um, and then it, with each year's wellness visit, we can track whether or not they might be suffering from dementia or we could uh, catch early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, but CMS hasn't accounted for new evidence showing that cognitive assessment tools could greatly improve the detection and the diagnosis. Um, I'm a working mom and my mother has Alzheimer's. I lost my father to Alzheimer's. And I think that our healthcare system must do better for the millions of Americans that are um, affected by this disease. And that's why I'm going to work with us against Alzheimer's on the Change Act legislation that's going to strengthen that early detection. Mr. Secretary, would you consider requiring the use of that screening tool for cognitive assessment at every wellness visit so that we could increase the early detection of Alzheimer's? Congressman, we would would look forward to working with you on screening tools like that. As you know, in the cancer moonshot, one of the first things we're doing is trying to get Americans to go back and do their cancer screenings. We we believe some nine to ten million Americans during the pandemic actually did not attend to their screening for cancer. And so whether it's for cancer, Alzheimer's, we absolutely agree that the earlier you do these uh, screenings, the greater the, the chance to detect and fight back any kind of cancer or disease that might occur. I'm glad you mentioned cancer, cancer because uh, many people during the pandemic prolonged uh, seeking that um, those screenings. And I, I think a CDC report last summer showed that breast cancer screenings alone declined by 87%. Uh, and so you're right, we need to do, we need to those healthcare screenings um, at their annual wellness um, wellness visit. I have other questions and uh, my time is running out. So I will submit them in writing. Hashtags. I will look forward to your response. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swigert, to inquire. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. And look, you have a great reputation as a verbal scrapper I need to step, and this isn't where I wanted to go, but being someone who's from Arizona, who was down on the border last Wednesday and just seeing the chaos, also being from Phoenix, it's the epicenter of distribution of fentanyl and my list of children who are dying or who have died. Our, our argument is the Border Patrol is basically now a concierge service. They pick up people, they put them in their trucks, they take them for processing, and entire sections are open because they're managing moving people. And the math is the math. I mean, when a year ago it cost, what, like $112 to get high in Phoenix, and today it's 12. This is not a Democrat problem. It's a not a republic. It's almost dystopian. And, and, and if you truly care about health and people, I mean, come to my neighborhoods and let me show you where I have zip codes that homelessness has doubled, where I have, I mean, there's something evil, destructive, heartbreaking happening. Um, now for the next bit of that's going to seem a little strange, I'm going to actually echo Lloyd Doggett on a couple things. So, you know, I'm on the right. and um, The telehealth. Whether you know it or not, years ago you actually did something, I think in this room, where you talked about I have this intense frustration when you talk about the ACA or we talk about our Republican alternative or some of our more left members talk about Medicare for all. You're talking about financing it, who pays and who gets subsidized. I want to beg of you, what can we do to disrupt the actual cost? 
not who pays, because we're not re like what the left just did in regards to insulin pricing. As uh, Mr. Doggett said, we're functioning taking $20 billion and subsidizing the very companies that you all accuse of gouging. We're handing them $20 billion instead of the co-ops that are about to go online, you know, that say they're going to do it at $55 for a box of five, under even the subsidized price, why didn't our policy work to help them bring those market disruptions faster? In that same concept, the telehealth that um, many of us are working on, please think about not telemedicine, but telehealth, the wearables, the, 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 the move. What can we do there? Because we proved seniors know how to work their phone. How do we use that as a way to disrupt the price as well as the accessibility, and not just by zip code? Congress, first, first if I can say um, thank you for the thoughtful and cogent way you've articulated your, the positions. And so let me try to be responsive to that and say, you're right. It, it can't just be about trying to subsidize a cost. It's about reducing the cost. Uh, I would say to you that uh, you talked about wearables. The more we can get into some of those, the quicker we can reduce costs. You know and I know that CBO sometimes, the Congressional Budget Office, sometimes gets in the way because what they see as a savings may, need, may not be what you and I agree is a savings. Hey, in, in, you actually have some very good staff that did a report about a year ago on the discussion of sometimes a curative, we may not see the real economic value for wow. a decade plus, and we're scoring in this window. So yes, your, your point is taken. And so we're absolutely willing to work with you because there are some things that on a bipartisan basis we can do that will reduce costs, not just mask the cost, that will be good. It's just we have to get through it. Most of it will be statutory, but you all have to do it then we have to execute. And so look Please. forward to working with you. It's disruptive. It's uncomfortable. We have $120 trillion of debt coming at us over the next 30 years. 75% is, is the shortfall in Medicare. If you're going to save Medicare, it's we've got to do the disruption. And with that, I yield back, Mr. I Chairman. look forward to being disruptive with you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, according to the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, a hospital stay for COVID-19 complications averaged about $20,000 per patient, with costs approaching $90,000 if a ven ventilator support was needed. Um, the pandemic exposed a lot of the fragility of the American healthcare system, but it also affirmed profoundly the wisdom of the Affordable Care Act, particularly as it relates to the issue of pre-existing conditions. And I didn't know the full authority of insurance companies prior to the Affordable Care Act because there's not only declinable medical conditions, which includes chronic lung, heart, and immune disorders for which applicants were typically turned down for coverage, but there are also categories of ineligible occupations, like high-risk occupations like grocery store workers, taxi cab drivers, rideshare drivers, uninsurable medication, which may not have been covered for some because of the emergency youth authorization that some of those vaccines had received, and also the issue of mental health issues prior to the start of the pandemic, which if people needed help during the pandemic, without that consumer protection, that patient protection, they would have been denied. 54 million adults prior to the pandemic had declinable, declinable medical conditions. Can you talk about the cost to the healthcare system as it relates to COVID? and the consumer patient protections of the Affordable Care Act versus what it could have been if our colleagues succeeded in trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act pre-existing condition protections 68 times. 
Congressman, I think you, uh, you sort of set it out pretty clearly. We are, it's hard to predict the what ifs when now Americans don't have to worry about losing their insurance coverage or never being granted insurance coverage because of a pre-existing condition. But for those 131 or so million Americans who have asthma, diabetes, or some other condition, which used to allow an insurance company to say, we're just not gonna insure you or cover that, uh, what, what's been the outcome for them? Well, they'll probably say it's, it's a priceless outcome of being able to access care for themselves or more importantly for their children. Uh, I will tell you that all those seniors that are today getting zero cost, uh, zero copay preventative services when they go in under Medicare, that would not have been possible but for the Affordable Care Act. So in so many ways, young or old, we've all benefited and are having a better life and a longer life. Yeah, and again, I, I was just very surprised to find that insurance companies could deny coverage for ineligible occupations. And I would suggest that in the context of a pandemic, they may have been able to add healthcare workers that were disproportionately exposed uh, to health conditions that relates to caring for other people. I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Becerra. It's good to see you again. Now more than ever, we must make wise decisions to address challenges Americans are facing in Indiana, in my district, and across the country, from combating the opioid crisis to uplifting families. Like many Americans, I have serious concerns about this administration's failures when it comes to all of these major crises. Instead of advancing realistic solutions, the President's budget continues to push the socialist spending agenda that drives inflation and doubles down on reckless spending. Secretary Becerra, when you appeared before us last year, you committed to follow up on many of our you committed to follow up on many of our concerns, but we haven't received answers to most of our questions, including questions just for the record. But we have received requests for for uh, funding, Mr. Chairman. I act like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record two letters that committee colleagues and I sent to HHS in April and June of last year regarding the crisis at the border and the surge in migrant children, as well as its impact on the domestic foster care system. While the crisis at the border continues to get worse, HHS has yet to respond to our so concerns. Ordered. Thank you. Secretary Becerra, can I get your word that HHS will finally provide a response in writing to these two letters? Congressman, I'm, I'm not... Uh familiar with the actual letters you're referring to, but we have responded numerous times over the last many months uh, to requests for information about the unaccompanied migrant children program that we have. And so let me make sure that we get you any specifics that may not have been included in those responses. I appreciate it. Defeating our country's opioid epidemic requires identifying possible ways to treat the very real problem of chronic pain. As a solution, Congress created the Pain Management Best Practices Task Force in the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Today, it's never been more important improving seniors' access to safe, effective, non-opioid pain management treatments and medical technologies. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, can you commit to providing a briefing on the status of the Support Act implementation, including uh, Dr. Todd Graham's pain management study? Congressman, we welcome an opportunity to brief you on some of those subjects. We'll just follow up with your staff if that's okay. Absolutely. And then my third question really quickly is the maternal infant and early childhood home visiting program that we all refer to as McVeigh, which is due for reauthorization this year, your budget calls for an increased funding of $3 billion. We want to maintain bipartisan support for McVeigh with two key reforms. We want to measure outcomes and improve reporting on the great work being done by the models in the states. I, I think you and I both agree this is an incredible program. And we want to continue televisits if evidence proves that virtual visits deliver the same quality, re, uh, vis, the quality results that we've come to expect. Congressman, thank you for your tenacious efforts on, on this particular subject. We look forward to working with you because we absolutely agree that the more we can do these, these visits, home visits, the, the greater the chance for better results. And my final question, Mr. Secretary, does HHS have any recommendations for improvement outside of increased funding, particularly related to making state outcome data more transparent? 
Absolutely, uh, and we've learned this from COVID. We, we really could use a better partnership with our state and local agencies that collect the data. Some are required to report, others are not, and it's been difficult to get uniform participation. Uh, it, we look forward to your help or the Congress's help in making sure that those who are collecting data share it so we can make it available to everyone because we all benefit from having quality data and more of it. Well, I will say really quickly that Todd Graham pain management study, um, we've already received some pretty positive information from your office, and I would really appreciate just your eyes on that to continue to move that along. Super important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I first want to add my um, voice to uh, the uh, series of Democratic um, colleagues that have praised the President's budget. I am particularly uh, proud of the increase in funding for uh, mental health. I think you uh, alerted to the fact that that is uh, something that has been acutely aware since the pandemic. Um, I also wanted to applaud the provisions that would uh, help close the Medicaid coverage gap. I think you know that uh, I, I represent a state of Alabama where, where that is one of the 12 uh, states that did not expand Medicaid. And so there are a whole host of Alabamians who are hardworking, um, who literally are the working poor. Uh, they make uh, too much money to be a part of Medicaid, but don't make enough money to be able to provide their own health insurance. And I want to thank uh, this, uh, this, uh, this administration and your commitment to helping to try to close that gap. Uh, the other thing that has been really a, a problem in terms of the rural health um, uh, care that the folks in my district are receiving, um, as you know, my district includes the historic civil rights cities of Birmingham and Montgomery um, and my hometown of Selma. What people don't realize is that Selma is sort of the queen city of, of a host of small rural uh, uh, communities in the uh, Alabama's Black Belt. And because uh, of not expanding Medicaid, we've seen so many of the rural hospitals that have closed be in states that have not uh, expanded Medi uh, Medicaid. Um, adding to that is the fact that we have a, a Medicare um, wage uh, index that, um, some t that unfairly discriminates against uh, certain states. Our um, reimbursement formula is so low that it really requires our hospitals to be super efficient in order to um, actually uh, eke out a profit. It. And uh, I know that you know that the Alabama delegation has submitted numerous letters regarding the, the Medicare uh, wage index and just wanted to, y your thoughts on what we can do to try to close that, that gap um, and, uh, and really help uh, us keep those hospitals open. Congressman, first, uh, thank you for the work that you've done to try to get everyone access to the, that same kind of quality care. And uh, again, it's, it's important because sometimes even in this committee, some of the questions, I think, were phrased in ways that misinform or disinform Americans about what we're really trying to do. When we see that level of underservice in parts of America, especially rural America, and as you pointed out, in black rural America, people suffer, people die. And what we're just simply trying to do is make sure that we don't let the lack of care be the result of a disparity in the type of care we provide. Absolutely. Um, and with that in mind, I also want to thank you and your staff for helping us with the Thomasville Regional Medical Center. Um, it is a hospital in Thomasville, Alabama, in the heart of the Black Belt uh, that opened up uh, right as we began this pandemic and um, did not receive the kind of allocation um, that other hospitals received uh, in the Provider Relief Fund. I do want to thank you and your staff for continuing continuing to help work with us. We know that having another closure in a rural hospital, especially in a rural hospital uh, that has been so, um, uh, if, you know, it opened up in order to provide access uh, to folks in that region um, would, would go a long way. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with your, you and your staff on this issue and really hope that you'll, um, um, I know that we've submitted letters to the president and to yourself and I actually would love to get those uh, admitted into the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. Um, and I just wanted to continue to ask your help on making sure that small rule uh, hospitals don't continue to close when we have uh, provider relief funds that would help us uh, keep them open. Thank we'll you, continue, sir. We'll continue to work with you. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, to inquire. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, I've been involved in a bipartisan way on the Alzheimer's issue um, and worked with a number of my colleagues on the other side and wanted to just uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the finalized national coverage determination and the frustration uh, that I have heard from many of the stakeholders in my district in Illinois, particularly as it relates to my rural population. Um, as you know, that determination for class of Alzheimer's treatment-related drugs severely limits coverage for FDA-accelerated approved drugs. I, I represent 19 counties across central, west central Illinois, including many rural communities. Uh, aside from the fact that this process sets coverage precedent that will limit future innovation and cures, it also severely limits access to an entire class of drugs for my rural constituents. Um, and that have been disproportionately uh, had a negative impact uh, on their communities um, and, and what they suffer from. Um, but my, my finer point on this, Mr. Secretary, is back on February 4th, uh, Paul Tonka, uh, Democrat, and I sent a bipartisan letter to you with four inquiries as related to the NCD uh, decision and or the determination. And I, I want to share my frustration, what we've heard from the lack of response from your office. And what is frustrating about that is, um, you know, we have four common sense inquiries that require a substantive response as it relates to rural coverage and nothing. Uh, and I want to share, uh, uh, I echo the comments of Mr. Kelly and others, and, and I think Mr. Pasquale said it best. If you can't respond, you shouldn't be here. And so when, when I think about the lack of response here, uh, Mr. Secretary, is it, do you need more staff to accurately respond? Congressman, thank you for the question, and, and legitimate question. But remember, in many cases, you're asking questions that I'm not yet able to respond to, because while we're under rulemaking, for example, I cannot be responding to things because we're in a comment period, and we have to accept all comments, and I can't say something just to you that I'm not saying to everybody so, else. So just reclaiming my time, that was before the comment period. The question, yes or no, do you need more staff to respond appropriately? Listen, I, I, I could always use a continued cooperation and work with... The, the question the is, do you need more staff to respond appropriately? Yes or no? Well, the, it, again, I, I want to make sure I'm clear. Can we you have, answer yes or no whether you need more staff? I have tremendous staff. Where we do have a, a great volume of work that we have to do, and we respond to it as best we can where we can, and oftentimes we can't because we're under obligation to to remain silent until we're allowed by law to respond. I, I'm going to take that as a yes. So if we can get you more staff to respond appropriately to all of these inquiries, I think that's better. I mean, your budget is $1.8 trillion. So if you need more money to appropriately respond, we want to work with you. And the other thing that's frustrating is you're a former member of Congress. You know what it means to be prompt, have a prompt response, to get back to somebody. Maybe it's a follow-up, and what you say is we're working on it. Congressman so-and-so, we're going to get back to you on it. But the frustrating part is we keep asking, we want to work with you on these issues, particularly as it relates to Alzheimer's, in a bipartisan way. And it's emblematic of our frustration up here with the lack of response when it comes to your office. So I want to help you in whatever way you need, more staff, more money, but we need better responses. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Del Bene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here with us, and thanks to you and your staff for all their work on putting together a really bold and forward-looking budget proposal for this coming fiscal year. Um, I wanted to start off by um, talking about prior authorization. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Kelly, and I have legislation that has garnered over 280 co-sponsors so far um, in the House that would streamline prior authorization. It's the Improving Seniors' Timely Access to Care Act. Um, it would streamline prior authorization and Medicare Advantage by requiring that it be standardized and electronic. Um, I know your team at CMS has been working on technical assistance on this, and I, we greatly appreciate that, and thank you. Um, this morning, the HHS Inspector General released quite a damning report on this subject, and I'd like to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. So ordered. Uh, the take key takeaways from the report are that Medicare Advantage plans 
denied prior authorization and payment requests that met Medicare coverage rules by using clinical criteria that are not contained in Medicare coverage rules, requesting unnecessary documentation, and making manual review errors and system errors. So these are issues that we try to resolve in our legislation and why we're working so hard to get that moving as quickly as possible. Um, I also wanted to, um, uh, to discuss Kidney X. Um, I appreciate that Kidney X is included in your budget proposal. Kidney X is a public-private partnership that was established to accelerate innovation in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of kidney disease. Kidney disease can be extremely debilitating, it cause, causing patients to leave the workforce, to die prematurely, and, and the cost to Medicare is substantial. Um, nearly a quarter of all traditional Medicare spending is on kidney disease management. And so, um, sadly, kidney disease disproportionately affects communities of color. Black Americans comprise 13% of the U.S. population, but represent 33% of Americans living on dialysis. It's just one striking example of the health disparities that we see in our country. And since roughly, roughly half of all patients who are hospitalized from COVID-19 suffered kidney damage, um, we can expect these figures to get worse. So Kidney X, when it was conceived, there was an expectation of $125 million from the private sector and $125 million from the federal government. The public-private partnership has been extremely successful in its first three years, running five prize competitions in which we've had 65 winning innovators tackling long unmet kidney patient needs and making inroads to an artificial kidney. But for the last two years, the budget proposal included only $5 million for Kidney X. So we'd like to see that be higher um, and work to make that $25 million. And I just ask for your commitment to help us increase that um, to $25 million as we go forward um, for future proposals like it was originally conceived. Congressman, uh, I cannot find anything I disagree with what you said. We are absolutely prepared to work with you to try to increase the opportunities. Uh, and when you go through the budget process, we will do everything we can with the money you give us to continue the Kidney X program. Thank you. And again, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, it's nice to finally get an opportunity to speak with you about surprise billing and more so about your surprise ruling. We've reached out on a bipartisan basis to try and set up a time to talk, and we've been reaching out to HHS on the issue of surprise billing for a while now. And you may have seen a number of the letters we sent to the administration over the last year. Last June, Representative Swazi and I sent a letter with 95 other members describing the congressionally passed surprise billing legislation. Last November, Representative Swazi and I were joined by 150 of our colleagues urging the tri agencies to implement the No Surprises Act in accordance with the law that we as Congress passed. Yesterday, Representative Swazi and I wrote again, urging that your rulemaking reflect the letter of the law and the Eastern District of Texas ruling in the TMA case. Our goal in this was to take patients out of this, to reduce their anxiety that often comes with the surprise bill. We wanted it to be fair. We wanted insurance companies to want doctors to be in network, and we wanted a, a plan that doctors wanted to be in network as a result. So let me back up. Congress spent years negotiating and deliberating how to solve surprise medical billing in a balanced fashion. And on behalf of patients, physicians on both sides of the aisle worked on behalf of patients to create a bill with our colleagues that will serve to benefit patients. And as a result, Congress ultimately rejected any plan that included a benchmark in it, yet you implemented a policy Congress explicitly rejected. The process laid out in your rulemaking does not reflect the way the, the law was written. Your rule actually violates the law, does not reflect a balanced process to settle payment disputes, and most importantly, does not reflect a bill that could have ever passed Congress. The IDR process set up in the law captures the unique circumstances of each billing dispute and does not cause any single piece of information to be the default that what is considered. Nowhere in the bill does it say the arbiter shall presume that the median and network rate should be the default factor considered. Your job is to implement law, not change law. I'm not a lawyer like you, but I did as a child watch Schoolhouse Rock, and I don't remember at the end where it said once the president signs this law, agencies have the authority to change it. 
If insurance companies know that they can pay a provider the median in-network rate, then there's absolutely no incentive to get them in-network. And who controls the median in-network rate? The insurance companies. It totally puts this in their hands. And this is dangerous for patient care. You know, it's, it's, if you think that they want to get everyone in network, that's really not how it's working in the real world. And especially in areas where insurers have a very large presence, they have all the leverage. And as soon as you released your rule, they sent out letters telling we're gonna cut what we pay you, or you have to get out. So docs do get out, and some stop practicing. So the reason I'm so concerned about the implementation of this policy as you put forward is the adverse effects that it has on patients. If you stray from the letter of the law, the policy will lead to narrow networks. And, and, and we are gonna have some problems. There won't be enough doctors available to take care of patients across America, especially in emergency situations, especially in rural and underserved communities where the margins are just so very thin, if you even can get over the margins. So, Secretary Becerra, as you may know, the U.S. District Court for Eastern District of Texas ruled that the government overstepped its regulatory authority in implementing the No Surprises Act. I'm very concerned that the DOJ filed a notice to appeal the decision. At the Energy and Commerce Committee yesterday, you said HHS is heeding the court ruling that came out re recently. Heeding means you're only taking notice of it. Can you commit that you will promulgate a final rule to implement the No Surprises Act consistent with the law passed by Congress and affirmed by the district court's ruling, not just heed it, but actually comply with it? Chairman Eric. Please. I'll try to be brief in responding. Congressman, thank you for the, the question. Thanks for going into detail on that. Um, and I can only say so much because of what you pointed out. We are in court. And also, we are still in the final stages of rulemaking, so I'm very limited in what I can say, which is what I try to explain to Congressman LaHood, and the reason why sometimes you don't get the response, substantive response you're seeking, because I'm restricted in what I can respond in writing or verbally. What I can tell you is that we will, we are continuing the rulemaking process. We hope to get through that fairly soon because we are getting cases. The, the law is already in effect and we are trying to enforce, but we are going to comply with the law. How? Uh, the final rule comports with existing law and the court rulings. Uh, we hope that what we come out with is something that will not only pass the muster of the courts, but also when you all come back, passes the muster, because I know at the end of the day, we'll continue to work with Congress to make sure we get this right, because no one wants any patient to st be stuck in the middle of, a, as I say, a food fight between a provider and an insurer. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, may I submit some documents for the record? So ordered. Uh, I'd like to submit this joint press release from Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, Education and Labor, published December 21, 2020. In here it clearly states the text includes no benchmarking or rate setting and that the arbiter must equally consider many factors. I'd also like to submit four letters for the record that were sent from members of Congress while drafting the No Surprises Act and nine letters for the record that were sent during the implementation of the No Surprises Act. And I would add that you're choosing to be in court. We don't have to be. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman should know that Mr. Brady and I have met with the secretary to discuss this very issue to make our views clear and known. With that, let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Secretary Becerra, first of all, I want to thank you and the Biden administration for listening to the science and beginning the process to end Title 42 expulsions at our southern border. But actually, today, I would also like to ask a question first about the public charge rule and then about foster youth. The 2019 Trump era public charge rule increased the prohibitions on public benefits that immigrants could use, frightening many from even using benefits to which they were entitled. I would like to thank you and the administration's work in ending this rule and I'm proud to have led a letter with over 45 House members in support of the Biden administration's more humane rule. However, over the past year, we've seen lingering impacts of the Trump rule, with many families fearful of accessing services such as health care. So what is HHS doing to ensure that immigrants feel comfortable applying for the health assistance that they're legally eligible for? Congresswoman, first, thank you for the question and your work in this particular area. As you mentioned, we don't want people 
to avoid getting the health care that they have a right to get simply because they've been uh, scared into believing they don't have access. And so with the public charge rule, what we have done is clarified that uh, Americans who are here, uh, uh, people who reside in this country, have an opportunity to make use of, the, for example, the CHIP program for children and some of the uh, programs that are available through Medicaid for some individuals. And what we would just try to do is work with our states uh, and local partners to try to commu communicate to individuals uh, what they have access to in terms of care. We could use your help because obviously there's, all, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of misinformation and disinformation that confuses people about what they can and cannot access. Thank you for that, I really appreciate it. Uh, and then there a question about foster youth. Um, Secretary Becerra, the family's first legislation was historic in changing financial incentives so that foster youth could stay with family wherever possible. However, we know that there will always be a population of these foster youth who need the intensive services that are delivered in group homes. The president's budget appears to impose a cut in federal reimbursement for those group home facilities. While we want to make sure that foster youth are with families whenever possible, I'm concerned that diminishing the resources for group homes could backfire and result in inferior care for the youth in these facilities. Can you comment on this cut, and can we work together to correct this? Congresswoman, uh, absolutely, we, we can work together. Uh, I, I want to make sure I know what provision you're speaking to, because as you can see from the President's budget, he's making a major commitment to things like mental health services, substance use disorder services, as well foster care. And so we're actually moving in the direction of trying to make it more available and accessible to those who need it so we get them early and prevent the types of longer health consequences that we see when people don't access the care they need. Well, I'm just talking about a subset of the foster youth funding, which has to do with group homes, which um, we know we don't want to uh, have a large number of youth uh, uh, put in those group homes, but nonetheless, when they are there, we want to make sure that they get adequate care. So that's where the cuts are very concerning to those of us who are working in the foster care system. Yeah, we'll work with you because I think what we're trying to do is focus as much as possible on community-based care versus institutions. Uh, but we know that on some occasions, it will be important to have the, the, the higher levels of care that might be available at some of these institutions. Thank the gentlelady. Thank gentle you lady. so much for that. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, Secretary. Good to see you again. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you during the Budget Committee hearing earlier this month. Uh, we had a very brief uh, minute to talk about Medicare. It's been brought up here again today. And I want to I continue on it because, frankly, I'm disappointed in some of your responses today, and I'd like to understand them. You, I want to clarify. You serve as a trustee on the Medicare. You, you serve as a trustee of the Medicare program, right? Correct. And there's a report annually. What, what's the purpose of that report? It's a report to give an update on where we stand on Medicare. And what is that? What is the most recent report? What has it said? That the uh, program continues to provide services, that in the outer years we will have to make when, some when is the depletion date? It is predicted to be somewhere around 2028. Six, 2026. 2026 completion date. That's how many years from now? Four years. What happens? when it's depleted? When that fund is depleted, the services that can be provided would have to be reduced. Do you think seniors understand that? I'm not sure if they completely get the message there. I'm not sure you understand it. We're, four, we're understand. four months out from that. What, what is then to happen after that report? Congressman, you understand that no, no. Congress has the, the power. The president to has a res the, your administration has a responsibility to respond to that report within 15 days, with a plan to save Medicare and ensure it's sustainable. You answered earlier that you're not even working on it. Am I am I right on that? No, you're not. What then? When will we see a report? The Medicare trustees will be issuing a report as they do every year. We will continue to provide the information. But the, the president is is tasked within 15 days to submit a report for ensuring the sustainability of the program. You're not telling me that's coming. He's, he's to submit legislation, proposed legislation. 
and I'm not hearing you say it. No, I don't believe you're correct on that. We are supposed to report. That no, the, the trustees are to report, and then the president is to support, uh, propose legislation in response to that report. You're not aware of that? The, the president, the administration cannot make changes to Medicare without the support of Congress making the changes statutorily. I, I, I know Congress, that. I know I, that, I but he is to years. propose legislation. One of the, one of the uh, goals, the, the roles of CMS, which is part of your agency, right? Yes. Is to protect our program sustainability for, for future programs. Is to protect our pro program sustainability for the future. Sorry. Mr. Secretary, do you think you're doing your job to protect Medicare for seniors in the future? We absolutely are making sure that seniors don't face cuts to the Medicare program and that if we're going to make any changes, it's so to tell make sure me one, one thing that you have proposed to ensure that Medicare will be sustainable, sustainable after just four years. Seniors in my district will be, if, if nothing is done, if nothing is proposed from the president, if Congress doesn't take action, if you aren't laying out the plans, seniors will be seeing cuts to their benefits that they've been promised and that they've relied on. And I am seeing, Mr. Secretary, no plan from you to change that. Congressman, uh, having served for 24 years where you are, and understanding that only you and members of Congress can change Medicare, Please don't put the fault on uh, on seniors or anyone else. It is up to Congress. I'm to not putting, don't put words in my mouth, please. I'm not putting the fault on seniors well, at all. I am saying this is, is problem, plan is to this is a problem that falls squarely within your jurisdiction, and, and I am report. not seeing a plan, and it's very disappointing to me, Mr. Secretary. The trustees will report. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to inquire. Thank you so very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and so wonderful to see you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, notwithstanding the polemic from our, our colleague, Mr. Jason Smith, I really appreciate the President and your department putting a racial uh, lens, uh, an equity lens, quite frankly, uh, in your budget. Uh, I appreciate your recognizing, for example, that uh, maternal morbidity and mortality mirrors so-called third world countries among African American women and uh, women of color. Uh, and I appreciate that as a, as a, a, a black woman and, and mother um, uh, and someone who has really put legislative efforts uh, forward to do this. I appreciate, and I'll ask you uh, in, if I have time, about the $20 million you're putting into doula training. Um, I also appreciate your making the IA IHS, the Indian Health Services funding, mandatory instead of discretionary. Again, another move towards some equity. And I have legislation I hope that this body will support to provide uh, scholarship and loan benefits um, under the IHS for uh, Native students that are similar to the National Health Services Corps, where they will be tax exempt uh, so that we can recruit professionals. Um, it's with regard to the cancer moonshot, uh, as an example, uh, the racial and equity uh, and, uh, um, um, and ethnic minorities are not represented well in clinical trials. Uh, and I'm hoping that there will be some effort toward that. I'll give you a good example. Uh, black women uh, disproportionately have dense breast tissue. Uh, and so a regular mammogram will not pick up those changes. And so I often wondered why the mortality rate among black women was so high. Regular mammograms don't pick this up, but the test that does pick it up costs $2,000 and it's not paid for by insurance. Um, I appreciate um, your focus on equity and child welfare uh, as, as you know, black women, women of color, are disproportionately having their children taken from them, and I believe it's for poverty, not because of, of neglect uh, 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 as much. Um, I'm really interested in portions of your budget that focus on community violence. There's a $100 million grant, and I was hoping that that would lend itself to de-escalate community de-escalation training 
that I have been proposing legislatively. I want you to respond to that. Uh, also want you to respond to what's gonna happen at the end of the public health emergency uh, besides just a 60-day notice to the states. How many people will that affect in terms of losing uh, health care? And again, why did you think doula training was so important? And I'll yield to you for those responses. Congresswoman, thank you for bringing up so many important issues. The doula training is important for the reasons I've been trying to articulate all morning, and that is that the, the more we focus on prevention instead of remediation after someone has become ill or is harmed by a medical condition, the greater the savings are for America, but the better health for that individual patient. And so the money that we devote to doulas is to make sure we're getting to people early and providing them with the help the support and the, the, in some cases, the training and services that those individuals could use to actually better care for themselves. And so it's a, it's a great investment, pennies on the dollar for the return, right? And right. so we will continue to move in that direction. Uh, the same thing with maternal health. We're going to make sure that if a woman is going to deliver a baby, it behooves all of us to make sure it's a healthy delivery uh, because not only is it good for baby and mom, but it's good for America if that baby and mom are spending more time in the hospital. So we'll continue to make those kinds of investments. Thank the gentlelady. Let Thank me recognize you. the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you. It's been a long day, I'm sure. Um, probably a long week. Um, but just for the record, you and I have never met before. I've never been served with you, so I don't know you at all. So my, my line of questioning is not about you personally. It's really about performance. I spent 35 years in business prior to coming here three and a half years ago, and um, I, I don't have time to deal in the personalities. It's really about performance. And, uh, you know, you work for the president, and the president has very low ratings right now because majority of America is concerned about directionally where we're going in the country. And the one thing you are responsible for uh, in the moment is running HHS, a very large organization, some would argue the largest, and there's a lot of responsibilities come with that. There, as, as I also started out my questioning with uh, Mr. Mayorkas, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, two weeks ago when he came to talk to the Border Caucus, this is not personality, this is about performance. And what we're seeing now for a year and a half is you know, somewhere north of two trillion, two, excuse me, two million people have crossed the southern border. And um, CDC's only band-aid for that, or a band-aid for the southern border, has been Title 42. Much has been in the news about that recently. And yet HHS has directed the administration to end Title 42, but at the same time recommending that Congress authorize more COVID relief funding. And now that's an $82 billion in his budget and continuing to recommend masks. And while you say cruise ships are different than schools, Title 42 implementation jurisdiction is based on the same public health emergency. This week, many of us in Congress have been getting um, hospitals and service providers, medical providers coming by. And I've heard from a number of my constituents this week about that mask mandate in hospitals. Numbers are low, but masks are still mandating. Staff quitting, patients struggling, and visitors becoming hostile. But when hospitals even question CMS guidance, they are asked, they're at their risk of being shut down. Now, I haven't gone and checked these, but I, it's time and time again, so this had to be a coordinated effort if it wasn't factual. So the pandemic remains a concern that you ask Congress for even more money and refuse to end the controversial policies like mass mandates, yet it's no longer a concern at the southern border. Something's not adding up here. Millions of Americans agree with me, which is a large factor in your boss's low approval ratings. Here are some of the things I can think we can agree on. First, we need to drive down health care costs. Second, we need, all can agree as Americans that the individual are better stewards of their own money than the federal government. And lastly, there's nothing more important than America's health. We same, share the same goals making health care affordable. And my concern is, is there's really nothing in the budget that truly addresses the underlying cost of care, as you've heard from both sides of the aisle today. And in spite of the promises of ACA, which you voted for 12 years ago, and they support expanding, doubling down, and we're so instrumental in California in keeping it the law, over the last 10 years, per person spending on health care increased by 28.7%, premiums jumped 143% between 2013 and 2019, and deductibles increased by an average of 35% over the same span. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, again, over 
two million people have crossed the southern border. And there have been over 220,000 apprehensions just this past month, a new record. Drug trafficking, highest death rate now in America is caused by fentanyl coming across the southern border. Can, can you, um, is there a public emergency or not? Health emergency. Congressman, we have, I have declared that the country is still in a state of a public health emergency, which please don't conflate that with what Title 42 is about. Uh, that's the problem. The, the way that people are confusing the issues is making it very difficult for Americans to understand what is going on. But I, I hope that what we can do is agree that we wouldn't use the ACA or we wouldn't use Medicare to deal with a migration challenge at the border. We should not use Title 42, which is a health care law, to deal with migration challenges at the border. Well, even your own border agents are concerned that, that when this is removed that they'll be completely overran. So while the administration, your office, my orcas, don't believe this is a problem, certainly your border agents who are in charge of protecting the sovereignty of this nation believe it's a real problem and have said so time and time again. And, Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to inquire. Uh, would the gentleman on mute, please? And I'm going to remind the members of the committee we will now proceed for a two-to-one ratio in terms of questioning with ample precedent. Again, Mr. Boyle, if you're unmuted, you can proceed. You're still muted, Mr. Boyle. Why don't we, Mr. Boyle, why don't we move to Mr. Beyer, and then we'll come right back to you. Mr. Well, we will do this. We will then go to Mr. Evans to inquire. <laughs> Would you turn on? Yes. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pennsylvania is considered a change in the Medicaid managed care program that could limit access to essential higher quality providers for Medicare benefits, including some hospitals that are only ones in their counties or specialty hospitals that provide essential care to women and children. Would you pledge to carefully review this proposal to ensure our, our most vulnerable Pennsylvanians do not lose access to their vital high quality providers? Congressman, uh, I pledge to work with you. I, when I was a member of Congress, I went through something very similar with the state of California, and so very much look forward to working with you on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question, real quick, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, health uh, Professor Opportunity Grants, HUB, is very important. Can you speak to the Biden-Harris administration commitment to reauthorize and expanding the HIPI program? The which program, sir? The HPI the program. You'd have to tell me what the... Okay. The Health Professional Opportunity Grant oh, Program. H oh, uh, right. Yes. That, that's a critical program because what we're trying to do is increase the number of profession health professionals we have, especially for communities that have uh, a workforce disparity. And so we're trying to get professionals, doctors, nurses to go into communities where there's a shortage. This is a great program that helps move these folks in that direction. And we, we know from studies that if you start work in a particular location uh, at the first go, you might stay there long term. Thank you. One last question. What more can be done by the Biden administration to address infants and toddlers coming into care at such high rates? In other words, in 2019, the Child Trend Report analyzed the adoption and foster care reporting system data, found that during the last 10 years, the rate of foster care entries for infants and toddlers have far exceeded the rate for older children. It, it, it's again a tragedy that we're seeing and I suspect that we'll find after the, the numbers come in that even with the uh, pandemic, what we've seen is an even worse condition. And what we're trying to do, as I mentioned in some of my previous uh, responses, is trying to target resources to help make sure that the foster care ha program has the resources it needs to uh, address that, and also, as in the case with Native American children, avoid the foster system altogether. And what we're hoping to do is build up families as much as we can so that we see fewer and fewer children going into the foster care system. I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your leadership and your experience, and I've really observed and admired how you have handled things. 
Uh, thank you. And yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Now we will move back to Mr. Boyle to be recognized. Mr. Boyle. Thank you. Doing it the old-fashioned way. You don't have to worry about technology uh, issues. So you have back-to-back -back members from, from Philadelphia here, uh, Mr. Secretary. I appreciated the opportunity in the Budget Committee hearing two weeks ago to talk to you about the mental health crisis in this country, and as I mentioned, uh, very much appreciative and supportive of the record increase your budget proposes in that. But since we already covered that, I instead wanted to focus on the cancer moonshot. Yes. And I did notice in the proposal an additional $5 billion, I believe. As you know, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States, only heart disease uh, exceeds it. So I was wondering if you could drill down on what that additional $5 billion would entail, and then I want to follow up and focus specifically on lung cancer, uh, if we have time. Congressman, thanks for the question. We, what we're hoping to do is reach a point where it's not just the research, but it's actual uh, treatments that are available in a quicker way. And so one of the things we're doing, which will be very inexpensive, is getting out and encouraging Americans to go back and do the basic element of screening. Too many Americans, especially because of the pandemic and the need to, to stay uh, away from a lot of facilities, uh, missed their screening for cancer, some 9 to 10 million Americans. If we don't detect those first stages of cancer, it makes it very difficult to try to help someone out. And so we're going to make investments in a smart way, obviously the research, obviously the ability to treat and hopefully at some point in the future cure. The president has a goal of reducing by 50 percent uh, the number of incidents of cancer that we see in the, in the future. But first and foremost, let's make the use of the resources we have. Let's target pre easy, preventative approaches. And one of the things that I'm proud of in representing uh, Philadelphia and the Philadelphia area is we have some of the leading research institutions on cancer. Specifically, I represent Fox Chase Cancer Center, which is one of the top 10 national cancer institutes in the country. And when you talk to the doctors there, they firmly believe that we can be radically in a different place, much better place, in terms of fighting and defeating cancer within uh, the next decade. Yes. Um, let me segue, because your last comments were actually the perfect segue on screening to what I wanted to focus on on lung cancer. There is, and I wanted to raise this to you, but also to my colleagues. Uh, lung cancer is one of the deadliest cancers within the family of cancer. Um, it is, in my view, not funded, research into it is not funded the way it should be. And for younger women, women who are non-smokers, they are not getting screened the way they should be because we have a system that was built around the now outdated notion that only those who were smokers were susceptible to getting lung cancer. Increasingly, you have young women, early 40s, getting lung cancer who were never smokers at all. So I, I want to raise that to your attention, but also if you could talk about specifically any efforts that you're leading uh, to focus on lung cancer, because I don't think it gets the attention that it deserves when you look at how many people are affected. Congressman, perhaps the best thing we can do is get people to believe, just as you would do a dental checkup, that you look at a checkup for potential cancer as something that is routine. And for women, obviously, we think immediately breast cancer, men, prostate cancer. But as you mentioned, it's not just those particular cancers. It's a, you have to deal with lung, the others. And so what we have to do is get back into this mindset that it's important to do our routine checkups. The screenings are invaluable. And not only do you catch certain things that you wouldn't expect, but it also gets, gets us quick, moving quicker to provide you with the resources and treatment you need. Uh, thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Secretary Becerra, for being with us today. You know, Kansas families are struggling with the rising cost of inflation, and that, in a lot of cases, has been due to the Biden administration uh, spending trillions on, on lots of different programs. So it's really important for us as a committee to focus on what's going on in the, in the budget. Uh, there's a lot of things that the budget doesn't do. I mean, it doesn't, it, it does mortgage the, our children's future. It, it doesn't address the border crisis. Uh, it, it, it attacks a, a lot of the provisions that have been around for decades on, on the issue of life. Uh, you know, in fact, it doesn't, uh, without the Hyde Amendment, it, it actually prevents, uh, or it actually would allow abortions in the United States, which is not what 77% of the United States uh, citizens want. 
uh, and including the 64 percent that said uh, claim to be pro-choice through that process. So, you know, we, we need a strong America and a strong a strong healthcare system. And I've got a couple questions. I want to see if we can we can get through in the time that I have. Um, you know, like like Secretary Sewell, uh, you know, I wanted to bring up an issue about the provider relief fund. Uh, there's three acute care hospitals in the country that opened in 2019 and 2020, and they received last uh, drastically less uh, support than the legacy acute care hospitals. Of course, one of these is in my district, uh, the Rock Re Regional Hospital in Derby, Kansas. I mean, Congress made clear in the uh, the provider relief fund was intended to help hospitals like Rock Regional. Uh, it's become uh, clear that the department's not given the same level of assistance. Uh, just if you look at the numbers, uh, the, the, these three hospitals received approximately 5% of uh, lost revenue support, whereas most of the acute care hospitals received about 88%. I want to see, if, I want you to, uh, I want to just ask if you would commit to have your office help resolve this issue and uh, so that, you know, we can't have new hospitals closing when we need so much good health care for people. Congressman, absolutely. Uh, look forward to working with you and your staff on this. Let me remind you again that uh, when we came in, the formula for distribution had already been set for most of those dollars. We did tweak it so we could be more fair in the distribution and more transparent. But let's work with you. At this stage, you know the money for the, under the Provider Relief Fund has been exhausted, but we can try to work with you and, and your providers to see where we can go. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a recent request from the agency which uh, which includes 81 billion dollars over five years for uh, biodefense, um, and you know under under your tenure HHS has failed to respond to multiple requests from Congress about previous research spending, uh, including a letter that I sent on February 2nd of this year, uh, specifically pertaining to gain of function research. Uh, my question really is you know. Um, has HHS or NIH uh, updated any internal policies regarding funding decisions about research involving enhanced potential pandemic pathogens that would prevent money from this budget to fund dubious research within countries like China? Uh, let me also, in any briefing we provide you also, if you wish, give you information on where we stand, where the NIH stands on that. NIH never supported any gain-of-function research, including at the Wuhan, Wuhan Institute of Virology in China. Uh, we, in fact, were uh, the entity, the NIH was the entity that re uh, proactively convened the National Science Advisory Board on Biosafety to tackle this issue and, and, and dig into it deeper. But let me make sure that if you have any unanswered questions, we could try to provide you with that information. Well, I would appreciate getting answers for those uh, for questions letter that we provided. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit the letter for the record. So ordered. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Mr. Secretary, I do not envy you this long, long morning. And I want to, a, a quick break, three comments more than hard questions. First, I had a lovely, strong conversation with Dr. Delphin Rittman um, recently uh, uh, at SAMHSA about the launch of the new 988 number yeah. for suicide prevention. And thank you for taking this so seriously, for making sure it's got a really good launch. This has been a bipartisan effort um, with a number of Democrats and Republicans putting this together. Uh, we also, um, you know, we have this bipartisan suicide task force with Republican John Katko and myself, and we put together a campaign to let people know about it. Um, I put this in every speech, and people are surprised every time that this is coming. So this, I think, um, we're going to see a huge surge in calls to the hotline, the lifeline. Thank you, by the way, for funding the additional, uh, the overflow lifeline centers around the country. Um, I think you know prior to this, only 80% of the calls were getting done, and the young people all want to do text. But um, when that one rapper did the song with but the 10-digit number, there was something like a 20%, 6% surge in hotline calls, and this saved a couple of thousand uh, suicide deaths, so um, thank you. Um, part two, um, thank you for addressing long COVID, and we're really thrilled the administration has recognized that this is, in fact, a disabling disease, um, and the work NIH is doing on long COVID is very meaningful. At the end of the day, we're still not meeting patients where they are. We're early, but we, the doctors don't know how to diagnose, we don't know how to treat long COVID, we need, the public needs to have much better awareness of the symptoms. This is a perfect use, by the way, for PCORI um, to engage with that and to build the community, uh, communities of long COVID sufferers to be able to understand. I mean, I'm sure you know that they estimate somewhere between 7 million and 23 million Americans are affected right now. 
And sadly, just because you're vaccinated twice and had two boosters, you're not immune from having long COVID. Um, so well, I've got a bipartisan bill with Representative Jack Bergman um, on this. Tim Kaine on the other side is leading the long COVID efforts. So thank you for partnering with us on this. And then finally, most of America seems to be functionally back to normal. Um, we have vaccines, testing, treatments, but that doesn't mean that folks should underestimate the risk that's still out there, especially for kids under five and those who are immunocompromised. And we're at this weird data, uh, weird time. If you look at wastewater data in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river, you've got a COVID high like we've never seen, but the hospitals are largely empty. So there's this, this disparity between the community's levels map, which you preside over, which is a reflection of who's in the hospital, and the transmission map, which is who's likely to get sick. My fifth grade granddaughter took a school bus trip over the weekend, 31 kids, 18 of them got COVID um, in their little van. So unfortunately, people are looking at the, the wrong map. Uh, all of this just goes to say that um, the current guidance, I know my Republican pals are all upset about the masks, but we're not through this yet. And with most of the world still unvaccinated, the risk of new variants, perhaps much more dangerous variants, more contagious variants, is very real. And we need a CDC that is as independent and accurate and willing to adapt the science as the science evolves as it can possibly be. So thank you for all your leadership on these issues. And I have 30 seconds if you want to say anything, but other than that, I'll yield back to the chairman. Well, I'll, I'll just say amen to what you've just said yeah. and uh, hope that people are heeding you that uh, we, we should all do what we, we know we should. Uh, be smart, use common sense, protect yourself, protect your kids, your, your grandparents. Uh, we can get through this, but we have to do it together. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal and Mr. Secretary. It's, it's always good to see you uh, here or in our district. I, I appreciate your, le your leadership and determination to strengthen our nation's healthcare ecosystem. And for my part, I just want to express my personal pre appreciation for the respons responsiveness of your team and your staff. Uh, we have received uh, responses to, to our inquiries. Uh, I, I truly appreciated you joining me in Waukegan to see the American Rescue Plan's funding at work. Your participation in our Pediatric Vaccine and Health Equity Roundtable amplified the importance of the vaccine confidence and our equity challenges. Addressing racial health inequities, population health, climate implications, and social risk factors requires work. But your visit showed, showed me that we share a strong preference for finding consensus-oriented solutions. You're building a Healthier America plan, Mr. Secretary, is making a difference, and I want to mention just a few of the components of that. ARPA's $3 billion investment in community mental health centers has already saved lives. I also applaud your work directing federal funds towards critical and proven harm reduction strategies, such as the per, uh, purchase of, of fentanyl test strips. Together, we can do more to prioritize policies like this that focus on population health. Towards that end, I hope you'll support establishing a population health task force to focus national attention on this issue. I look forward to following up with you on the issue I also applaud your work establishing the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. This appropriation season, I'm advocating with my colleagues, Congresswoman Bustos and uh, Barragan, urging appropriators to provide for the new office's robust funding. As a former member of this committee, you deeply understand we must all work closely to get together, Congress and the administration, to achieve our continued success. I do have two other topics I want to touch on in questions. Let me start with the physician fee schedule. As you know, updating the Medicare physician fee schedule is a critical part of preserving access to quality care. Congress is still dealing with emergency measures to prop up physician payments each year, while physicians are asking Congress to authorize an annual payment update similar to what hospitals secured. Mr. Secretary, can you please share how annual physician payment updates ensure Medicare beneficiaries have continued access to care, address critical workforce issues by retaining physicians, and allow independent physician practices to remain solvent, and can you also please describe how HHS will work with Congress to provide physicians with greater fiscal stability? Congressman raised a lot of great points, and on this particular subject, the phys physician fee schedule, let me try to give you a succinct response by saying, first, we have to make sure that those doctors, those medical providers are there for uh, 
all those folks who paid into the Medicare system. We'll, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we are somewhat constrained in how, how much latitude we have to do things because of the requirement for budget neutrality in anything we do. And so that's where we need to work with you and your colleagues to make sure that as we move forward on the physician fee schedule, we're trying to make sure that we protect access to care for, for seniors and others on Medicare. At the same time, we make sure that we're adequately compensating physicians. Great, um, thank you. And, and I also want to touch on community violence intervention funding. Uh, these programs identify the highest risk populations of being involved in gun violence and work to reduce violence through tailored interventions. The administration has called for increased funding for this program, and I definitely agree. From the perspective of gun violence as a public health issue, how do these programs curb violence in the communities across the country? Can you touch on maybe some successes you've seen in areas we can work to develop? Yeah. Congressman, uh, you know, we, we know that there are things that we now call social determinants of health, things that determine what your health will be like that aren't necessarily in the medical or health space directly. One of those is violence. When you're a five-year-old and, and you've grown up and witnessed someone getting shot, when you see the violence around you, uh, there are consequences to all of that. We can help reduce that violence. There's a better chance that that five-year-old is going to grow up healthy. And whether that it's the child who inadvertently is a, the victim of a drive-by shooting, or just someone who witnesses a drive-by shooting, the health is impacted. And we have an obligation to not close our eyes to the fact that violence is a health issue. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentle lady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady, and good afternoon to you, sir. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. I'd like to address a recoupment issue that is facing hospital-based nursing schools. As you may be aware, a technical glitch on the part of CMS has made it that the hospital nursing schools across the United States have to pay back millions of dollars to CMS. I'm a co-sponsor of the TRAIN Act, which would seek to remedy this fix. In the meantime, can you commit to working with the MACs to ensure that they are giving these schools as much flexibility as possible? Congresswoman, let's, uh, I'm more than willing to work with you and others on that particular issue because what we want to make sure is we're expanding access to health, not diminishing it. Thank you so much. This is an unprecedented situation that these schools are now faced with. And one has come about really through no fault of their own. So as we emerge from the pandemic and we hear from so many sources about the nursing shortage that we have, we don't want to make it worse by trying to do this. I want to also draw your attention to the critical role that your department plays in overseeing our nation's child care and low income programs like temporary assistance for needing families. The administration's human services agenda seems fixated on paying people not to work. And this has kept workers on the sidelines, creating a national worker shortage and really giving, driving up the cost to the businesses and the families. Now is the time to re-engage our workers who are on the sidelines by removing barriers to work. TANF is a key program for upskilling and getting people in the workforce. For the second year in a row, your budget says that you want to work with Congress to reauthorize the program, but it includes no vision for reform and zero opportunities for improvements. In addition, there have been no proposals from the Democrats on the committee to address this widely acknowledged program, as well as the problems like poor accountability and little emphasis on work supports. Republicans are ready to find a bipartisan solution to assisting our families who are the most in need. Our plan presented, our plan that we presented is the Jobs for Success Act, and it restores the focus on work, which is exactly what we need to do right now. Our plan invests in marginalized workers, it promotes 21st century case management, and it develops the workforce, linking federal benefits to the pursuit of work and the schools skills that are needed to work. On child care, the president's budget will undermine American families by crushing future generations in unaffordable debt, all the while driving up inflation. This massive child care spending program has been regarded as part of a deficit neutral reserve fund. Let me be clear, just because you say a program will pay for itself doesn't make it happen. This child care agenda ignores the enormous investment Congress has already made. 
Congress has provided more than $53 billion in new funding for child care in just two years. This is on top of the existing federal $20 billion early care and education funding that is already provided annually. It is important for Congress and HHS to make sure that we are setting our states up for success. We must ensure the money is there and it's making its way to the hands of the families. I have one question. You say you're ready to work with Congress on TANF reauthorization. Republicans do have a plan, and we are ready to find bipartisan solutions to strengthen TANF. Will you prioritize TANF and encourage the committee Democrats to share this commitment to get America back to work? Congresswoman, it's an important program, and I commit to you to be, able, to be willing to reach out to you and others to work with you and others on the TANF program. Thank you so much. Thank the gentlelady. The Gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity. And of course, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Also, thank you for being out in my district, especially right in the middle of the pandemic when you came out there and saw the good work that uh, our federally qualified health clinics and our farmers and our farm workers were doing to get vaccines to the people who needed it the most. So I truly appreciate you um, shedding a lot of light on a partnership that I thought was just very instrumental for us at the local level and how all levels of government work together. I thought it was a great, as well as our public-private partnerships, it was a great example of that. And thank you for being there to give them credit where credit is due. I really appreciate that. Speaking of local, I want to talk about um, Medicare margins at this point. Obviously, uh, MedPAC reports that the average hospital in the United States has a negative Medicare margin of 9% in my district where you were in, and in other high cost areas surrounding there in the central coast of California. Hospitals have Medicare margins worth worse than a negative 50%. In fact, I represent three counties with the three highest hospital wage index values in the nation. However, the current geographic adjustment factors which determine how to adjust payments for regional costs were designed 30 years ago. Do you believe that it's still effective in making those designations? And would HHS ever study whether the current geographic adjustment factors to help them better reflect costs today in places like California could happen? Congressman, you, you bring up a point that uh, I think we've been discussing growingly uh, over the years because of the disparities that we see. Uh, and I would be more than willing to make sure that our team is working with you and those in Congress who are interested in looking at this because what we're finding is that disparities are growing greater and that means that uh, Americans are losing coverage because they're not getting sufficient uh, support from the federal government through Medicare, Medicaid, and the various programs. That's right. And I, and I look forward to working with you on that any way possible and providing uh, good examples uh, of what can happen. Um, also, a, a, a tri a shifting to a somewhat similar topic, geographic adjustments. Obviously, Medicare geographic adjustments, like the geographic practice cost index values, are meant to offset higher cost of care in some areas. In my district, these adjustments have just not kept up with the cost of care. They've created access challenges for constituents receiving traditional Medicare. Um, I would hope that you're concerned about areas where geographic adjustments have not kept up, and would HHS also be open to studying this further? Congressman, we are ready to do that work with you to look into those things because, again, coming from California, I know exactly what you speak of. Exactly. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, it's always good to see you. Good to see you. Um, you hear my district there? <laughs> Technically now my district, um, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I'm glad you're here because I wanted to talk to you about um, the concept of health equity with somebody who knows the needs of my district as well as I do. Um, the fact that you represented the region for 30 years um, and you did it uh, admirably and it, you did a great job, but you know that my area of Los Angeles, our area of Los Angeles is always disproportionately impacted by climate change by highways, by pollution. And it's often um, these areas that have, uh, have negative health, uh, greater negative health outcomes because of it. Um, and the residents of East LA have long faced that. Um, and that's something that we're trying to un undo um, and it's gonna take time. I'm proud that I was able to get some um, 
money, uh, 950,000 for Ramona Gardens Natural Park, you know, the park that they're trying to build right next to the highway for a long time. We're, we're lucky that we got community funding projects back in, and that will help transform those four acres um, of underutilized, underused land um, into a space that will help uh, protect um, that community of Ramona Gardens from the freeway right next door, improving air quality, reducing noise pollution, and serving as a, a key source for shade and urban cooling. Um, that's why it was designated as a Green New Deal certified project. Um, the idea that you can improve people's lives while still combating climate change in, in a responsible way. Um, so that is an example of a of the local impact of a national climate resiliency and health equity agenda. Um, and on the national level, you, you, as you know, President Biden made it a top priority in his first week in office to create the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity at the Department of Health and Human Services. This office, I believe, is, is essential to carrying out the research, coordination, and innovation necessary to protect vulnerable communities nationwide and continue to uh, the important work on climate equity, and that's something that you ha started when you were in the as an attorney general and as a member of Congress. Um, I just want to um, see if you can speak to the administration's priority for the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, and then um, what has been achieved since its creation. Congressman, by the way, Congressman, when I say Congressman, I mean you would be my Congressman if I were still back home in Los Angeles. So great to see you, and thank you for all the work you've done. And the folks in Ramona Gardens understand just how important it is to have that space that you're helping with. Uh, you, you probably gave a, a, a better example than I could in terms of why it's so important. Here you have a community, Ramona Gardens, very hardworking individuals, but often in places that most people wouldn't want to go to. And they're, they're working hard, raising their kids, and now they're going to have an opportunity to avoid the, the, the different uh, ramifications of having freeway right by you. And so the more we can offset that, by giving them green space, by giving them a chance to have trees around, all those things that help improve conditions by understanding what climate change does to people, and it does it now, we're able to help them later on. And we believe that the better off they are in terms of their life, the better off they are in terms of their health. And absolutely, climate change is a health issue. Um, and since, um, what else can be, um, done to help these frontline communities um, through the new um, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity? Well, we can do any number of things. Right now, we're asking health care facilities to tell us what their climate footprint looks like, because believe it or not, uh, as I think was mentioned earlier, about 10 percent of the, uh, the issue of uh, pollution and so forth is, is a product of what the health care sector produces. And so the more we try to tackle it by making sure those facilities, including facilities close to the neighborhoods that you represent, are doing a better job of protecting the environment, the better off everyone will be. But more specifically, your point about making sure we take into account the ills that are caused by climate change directly, in especially communities of low income and low resources, the better off we'll be. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you. Thank you. And Mr. Secretary, I'm delighted that your successor has chosen to remind all of how effective he has been since he assumed <laughs> yes. that role. <laughs> so moved. And he has been. And he has been. <laughs> the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your service, Mr. Secretary. In the interest of time, I'm jumping right in. Right to it. President Biden's fond of saying that uh, you show us your budgets, I'll show you your priorities. The President has laid out his priorities in his budget, and uh, including the health care budget. I'd like to address two of the, uh, of the major misplaced priorities from this administration that will cause catastrophic consequences, literally catastrophic consequences to, to our country. Um, the Medicare Trust Fund, as you know, is running out of money uh, by 2026. That's the closest we've gotten to insolvency in three decades. And um, not only does the president's budget slash priorities not address this real crisis, it doesn't even mention it. His health care budget mentions climate and the climate crisis 16 times, Mr. Secretary. Not once does it mention the real crisis that our seniors face, 
There, there's not a scientist on either side that can say different things. Republicans, Democrats, actuaries, economists, everyone knows that this will be a major disaster for the 65 million seniors, 10,000 a day coming online, needing this safety net, depending on this safety net, but not having a plan, not even mentioning addressing it. I hear about vulnerable people and disparity and inequity. I can't think of a greater disparity to a more important group of Americans than these seniors who don't have their president. And I haven't heard from you, Mr. Secretary, in the budget, I think you own the budget too. I see no plan. Now, in addition to that, there is a plan and there is a priority to expand a failed government control health care program uh, called the Affordable Health Care Act, the Obamacare, which was neither affordable nor did it give greater access to the American people, but we're going to expand it. Here's the real insult in this whole thing. We're expanding it to people. I should say the budget of the president, y'all's budget, will expand it to people, subsidize the expansion of Obamacare to people making $500,000 a year. Now, you realize half of the people on Medicare are on a fixed income making less than $30,000. I, I, I call that a major hole in the plan and a major misplaced priority. Um, I can tell you my seniors in West Texas aren't thinking about the end of the world on account of carbon emission. They're thinking about the end of their world when there's no plan and this important safety net collapses. They're not worried about rising sea levels. They're worried about the rising cost of their health care, Mr. Secretary. Now let me switch gears here. I got less than a minute. Your administration is still imposing vaccine mandates on the American people, from our troops to our health care workers. Also, you're fighting a mask mandate, tooth and nail, on mass transit, where the courts have struck it down. Either your administration is trying to send a message to the American people that we the government is in control of we the people, or you believe that it is justified because of a public emergency, public health emergency, to impose these mandates on the American people. Well, if you believe, like the agency says, and the experts, that there, we are still in this public health emergency, how in the world, in good conscience, can you give a pass to people who are coming to this country illegally by lifting Title 42, but still putting these unnecessary freedom-infringing mandates on American citizens in the name of a public emergency? There's a disconnect there. It's incongruent. And uh, it's upsetting, and I yield back, and I thank you for the time. Thank the gentleman. I'd love, Mr. Secretary, would you like to answer that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it would be difficult, to, uh, again, to untangle the uh, misinformation that was uh, articulated to be able to respond well. And again, the, the, the intermixing of two different elements, health care laws, migration laws. But uh, I can always respond later on uh, if, if the Congressman would like to sure. follow up. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize uh, the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to inquire. We will come back to Mr. Horsford. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Secretary, for your patience and your willingness to spend so much time with us and going through such very important issues. Uh, we appreciate your office. Uh, I wanted to, of course, ask you about the need for supplemental funding for further national COVID-19 responses. Um, what additional funds does the administration need to address the pandemic at this time? Do we think that we've reached a stabilized area uh, and what specific requests and what activities would CSER be delayed without additional funding? Congresswoman, thank you for the question. Uh, we've articulated to Congress that in order to continue the existing work in tackling COVID-19, we would need more resources to continue with the vaccines and the therapeutics that are required to make sure that everyone is as protected as possible against COVID-19. The President's budget also does call for a long-term vision that goes beyond uh, COVID-19 to deal with future pandemics 
the different, the different, different types of biomedical scares that may come our way and be ready for those. That's a long-term investment. So short-term, we need monies to finish the job with COVID. We're very close, but we need more resources. Long-term, we have to be ready for whatever comes next and the president uh, budget calls for the resources for that. Thank you. Um, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't use this time to uh, talk about the issues of the territories with regard to your agency. Uh, HHS funds the Welfare Rules Database maintained at the Urban Institute to capture the rules regarding determining eligibility and benefits for TANF assistance. It does so for 50 states in the District of Columbia, <laughs> excuse me, but does not include the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Um, additionally, supplemental security income, SSI, is not available to the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And these jurisdictions operate public assistance programs instead of the population aided by SSI. Now, you know, we've just got a blow from the Supreme Court with regard to SSI and its application to the District of Columbia. Um, has HHS considered expanding the Welfare Rules Database to the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam so that eligibility and benefits rules are available for those jurisdictions in the same way they are um, for the 50 states in the District of Columbia? Congresswoman, as you know, the, uh, the territories, including the District of Columbia, as well are unique under unique circumstances under law. And we look forward to working with you. I think the president made it very clear in the actions that he has taken to try to uh, support the territories to make sure that we address their, the, the way they are treated under the law, given that they are, uh, they have unique treatment within, within the various areas of, of healthcare. So I, I can't give you a direct answer, but I'm certainly working, willing to work with you on this because we're gonna to try to do everything we can for anyone who is a US citizen living in the territories and those Americans who have in many cases served uh, in the military to defend this country uh, as best, best we can, recognizing again, as I said, the unique circumstances under the law that the territories find themselves in. Sure, I mean, I understand that with regard to funding, but I guess what my question is, is just even um, the welfare rules database, which captures the rules regarding determining eligibility um, that were not in there. And, you know, no other place is so as unique as the District of Columbia, but the District of Columbia is included in that. Um, what would it take to include the other territories, the territories in, in such a database? We could work with you, Congresswoman, to see if that's a possibility and how we, how far we can take that. More than willing to look into that as much as, much as possible, because as I said again, we want to make sure we're not leaving anyone behind. Thank, Thank you, the Thank you very much. The gentleman from Nevada is recognized to inquire, and then we will proceed to Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. It's great to see you, Secretary Becerra. I know we have a short time, so I'll jump right into it. Uh, last week, you and I spoke at the Nevada Health Center in my district uh, about the bipartisan cancer uh, moonshot initiative, and I want to thank you and the administration for including that in the budget. This is a very important initiative to all Americans to beat cancer once and for all. One of my concerns is in equitable access to preventative services, cures, and treatments for communities of color who have historically faced access barriers across the board, especially for those in rural parts of my district. So can you just share a little bit about the budget and how this will work to address some of these issues? I'm sorry, Congressman, in what part of the budget? On the uh, prevention to access uh, for cancer. As I've been saying throughout this hearing, uh, we are going to try to do what we can to help when it comes to cancer because it's not just a matter of trying to find a cure. It's trying to prevent Americans from getting to the point where they have no choice but to pray for a cure. And we know from our recent experiences with COVID that a lot of Americans missed out on one of the principal elements of prevention, which is the screening that has to occur. So one of the things that we're going to double down on is making sure all those Americans some nine to 10 million we, we estimate missed out on their screening uh, visits, that we get back into the habit of routinely going in for those screenings so we can detect any cancer before it gets to the point where we can't do anything about it. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you. I know there's some new technologies and advancement out, that, out there that can also help uh, from blood tests uh, to other types of screening that can also help with this. Uh, Secretary Becerra, I wanted to just touch on uh, 
HERSA funding uh, briefly, the uninsured program that helped uh, some 300,000 uninsured in Nevada. Um, so w are there other sustainable sources of funding that can be used to help cover the cost of COVID-19 test treatment and vaccines for the uninsured? And what can we do in the meantime until this funding is restored? And additionally, how are you working to otherwise reduce the number of uninsured and increase enrollment in the ACA exchanges to get more people into affordable coverage? Congressman, as uh, we've mentioned, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, we continue to provide services to the uninsured and to help providers who are actually doing the right thing by providing services to the uninsured. The provider relief fund monies that we made available and, and kept as long as we could to provide reimbursement for testing and treatment and the longest period of time for vaccinations has now essentially closed its doors to be able to reimburse providers. We hope that Congress will provide us with additional resources there so we can re-up the program. But short of that, we'll continue to work with states. For example, we're working with them to make sure that anyone who is not accessing care today uh, or has access to care, for, excuse me, today under the Medicaid program, but may lose it as we wind down the public health emergency and a, lot, a number of people would drop, that we find everything possible to see if they qualify for the Affordable Care Act marketplace coverage, or perhaps even within the Medicaid program, so long as we update their data. Thank you. I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to touch on the community health centers. I know that there's $90 million increase for health centers, uh, but also includes a reference for the second year and want to work with you and the administration to ensure that we are uh, adequately funding um, these health centers, which have been at the forefront of addressing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and other health-related issues. So thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for your leadership to all of those serving at HHS uh, for their service. Uh, we, we appreciate your leadership. And you mentioned the health centers, which is another way to make sure we get to those who might otherwise be uninsured. I thank the gentleman. Let me uh, now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Dr. Murphy, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary Becerra, for coming today. I appreciate it. I'm batting cleanup, so get ready. Um, I'm a surgeon. I have a surgeon kind of mentality. It's a captain of the ship mentality. I don't pass the buck. That's who we take, and that's what I would expect as someone who runs a department in our government. A um, couple things I just want to bring up to you. Would you agree you're an attorney? I didn't go to law school. I couldn't do the papers. I went to med school. I had to do the pictures. Um, that the law is the law and the letter of the law is the law. I say this because the surprise billing issue that we dealt with in both chambers was very, very clear. Very, very clear about what the letter of the law was. And so it really hurts us, because I actually take care of patients still, that your administration is put this still through court, that you want to give all the power to insurance companies and none really to those who actually provide care, like me. So do you believe the letter of the law is a letter of law as an attorney? I think we must respect the law and comply with it. We do that every, every day that I know. Well, I, I hope it will and we can get this nonsense and that you retract the, uh, the lawsuit that's in the courts. Second, second, I take care of Medicare patients I have for 30 years. I have colleagues who don't want to take care of Medicare patients because they don't, they don't pay the bills. And then you, you, you pushed it back and said that the solvency of Medicare depends upon Congress. It is your administration that gives us plans to how keep this agency and how keep Medicare, 65 plus million seniors, which is an ever expanding group, keep that solvent. When are you going to come out with a plan? Congressman, if you're the captain of the ship, then you know that only Congress can come up with the long-term solutions for Medicare. We can work with you. The president has proposals out there. He has, for example, talked about reducing the cost of drugs. Uh, for Medicare recipients, which would save us billions and over the years trillions of dollars. We follow the plans that agencies give to us because you guys are the experts. CMS is under your leadership. Congressman, you got that reversed. We execute what you've told us yes. by law. Well, okay. Well, then let's go back to surprise billing then. You're not executing what we told you to do. So let's not have double standards. Well, nope, that's not a double standard. It's a, it's a different interpretation of the law. I think the law is pretty clear, and I think everybody on this committee believes it is. All right, let's move to the fentanyl crisis. You know, you said 80 percent comes to our ports and 20 percent comes the other way. We, right now, the largest part 
The largest uh, number of individuals from 18 to 45 are dying because of the opioid epidemic. Even your administration, in the first time in a 12-month period, we've lost 100,000 individuals. This is personal to me because I know a lot of kids who have died from this. Even your administration says that this is going to get much worse because of the explosion, especially that that's happened in the last 18 months and the number of illicit fentanyls that have come across our border. What is your plan to fight this? We have a plan to do the prevention, the treatment, the follow-up services. I think you're referring more to the plan to try to interdict drugs from coming into the Correct. Country. We have to choke the supply because the supply, to the point now, there is so much coming across our border. Yeah. And, and it's not, I'm not going to jump on the immigration issue, that the cost of fentanyl has dropped 50 percent on the streets of America because every city, I speak with sheriffs in my district, every city is affected by this. Well, and then I appreciate that you won't conflate the issue of Title 42 and the... I didn't bring migrants. up Title 42. I understand, but others have tried to make the case... That's other people. Understood, but what I'm trying to make clear is that you're right, we have to address drug interdiction at the source, at the border or wherever else it might come in, and the, the president has a plan. The Department of Homeland Security could give you more details versus the Department of All Health right. and Human Services. But there is a plan. Thank you for not conflating nope. Title 42. All right. Fentanyl. Thank you. Um, my time is up. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I can, I'd like to submit a record, Table A, from the final physician fee schedule. It's about MIPS. It's about the merit-based and payment system and about equity. Without it's objection. In there. I've had to deal with MIPS for years. That's another broken system. Um, I'd also like to uh, put for the record, and I really would like to get some responses. I'd like to have it in three months. I mean, we're still waiting on responses from this committee from last year to your office about the Health Professional Opportunity Grant Program. It's a failed program, and I want to confirm that we're not going to be uh, funding this duplicative and effective program. And then finally, to close out the day, uh, I'd love to have some questions about the 20% increase in reimbursements. The health crisis, the, the health emergency still continues to go on, but at some point we have to pivot. At some point we have to pivot because the country is bleeding because of what we're paying for. Without objection. Crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Just before the gentleman arrived, at, uh, I pointed out to the committee members that Mr. Brady and I met with the secretary on surprise billing. We have made the committee's position clear, and we intend to adhere to that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for your time today and your succinct answers as well. And I want to uh, point out that it's always a delight to welcome a former member of the committee back. Please be advised that members will have two weeks to submit written questions that will be answered later in writing. The questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned. We did that.